seeing that we have a quorum, I want to apologize to everybody even before that. I came in and it turned out uh, not only was a 14th Street exit closed from Highway 40, I come from the west, that uh, when I ended up taking the first detour, I ended up on a second detour, so I ended up circling City Hall uh, several times. Um, but we do have a quorum now, and uh, uh, we'll go ahead and begin the meeting. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Alderman Boyd. Present. Alderwoman Davis, Alderwoman Hubbard, Alderman Coltar, Here. Alderwoman Spencer, Alderman Oldenburg, Here. Alderwoman Boyd, Here. Chairman Rohde. Uh, present. Five present, you have quorum. Okay, uh, today we have, um, um, well, actually, why don't we go ahead. Uh, the clerk does such a nice job for us of... Um, preparing a uh, order of business here I and of course I inadvertently neglect it uh, we had our roll call excused aldermen at this point I don't know if we've had any call in for excuses um, approval of the minutes um, chair will entertain a motion for I move for approval of minutes dated July 2nd 2019 second, second. moved and seconded madam clerk call the roll Alderman Boyd. Aye. Alderwoman Davis. Alderwoman Hubbard. Alderman Coltar. Aye. Alderwoman Spencer. Alderman Oldenburg. Aye. Alderwoman Boyd. Aye. Chairman Rohde. Uh, uh, present. Aye. I'm sorry. Five aye votes. Uh, let's see. So uh, today we have three board bills and we have a presentation. Um, one of the board bills, and I'm trying to give everybody a little bit of a preview of what to expect, uh, all, board bill number 88 by Alderwoman Martin, sponsored by Alderwoman Martin. If you're here for that, Alderwoman Martin called last night, and evidently there has been some, um, I guess, uh, last minute glitches or discussions or reworking of that, and she has asked that that board bill be held in committee. So that will not be heard today. That's board bill number 88. The intent is, is, is that we would um, um, probably take that up in two weeks. Um, so that's uh, not going to be heard today. Alderman Kotar has a board bill uh, that we believe will be non-controversial. We'll try to... Oh. Uh, take that up relatively quickly here. Uh, if it's all right, I usually have the presentation made at the beginning of the meeting. We we've tried to schedule presentations to, to develop a better world view or city view, and today we're going to do one on, on uh, affordable housing. So we'll probably take up, uh, we'd like to take up Jack uh, Alderman Coter's bill first, then we'll have a presentation. Uh, and then we, our last bill will be Board Bill 103, and I think there'll be some discussion on that. So that's kind of the intent today. I, uh, going forward, members of the committee, I've uh, passed out a memo uh, or sent out a memo last week, and the goal was to try to get a little better organized so that everybody could plan their schedules accordingly. I hope you received it, but if you haven't, I'll try to go through that now briefly. Uh, today is obviously uh, the uh, October the 2nd, and um, uh, we're going to have a presentation from the CDA, and we have a couple board bills. Generally, what th what's driving this agenda is, is that some of the board bills have timing requirements on advertising, so I've been work trying to get a little better organized and work with both SLDC and zoning on what their advertising requirements are. Then we can go ahead and schedule these meetings a little bit ahead of time so everybody knows when they're coming. And then we can also schedule outside speakers. So the outside speaker today is our director of CDA. Uh, I don't think he's been before our committee since his appointment, but we'll have him and he'll talk about a, a, an RFP that just went out last Friday for affordable housing, something I've been talking quite a bit about. Uh, on 10-9, uh, St. Louis Development Corporation is going to come through, and they're required to provide us an, an annual update on the uh, economic development plan. The plan has not been completed, but they're uh, obligated to do that, I believe, in the month of October. And uh, um, since it's not done, we're having them come over then to, to make a presentation. 
with all the discussion about tax abatement and its impact on the schools beginning several years ago, we've been inviting the CFO of the public schools to come over each year. So this will be her third year. She will be here on 1016 and give us an idea of how the schools are doing. Uh, as I think everybody knows, they receive about 60% of the real estate taxes that we collect in the city. And so obviously what we do with tax abatement impacts them and we are wanting to get a little bit more creative and um, um, strategic in, in how we're doing that. On 11-6, uh, I'm not sure if we even have any board bill scheduled for that day or anything was advertised, but we're kind of holding that open. And then on 11-20, we're going to have a presentation. We had a presentation last year from the St. Louis Federal Reserve. Uh, this year, um, Dr. Hollins and I have been uh, working on this schedule together. And one of the things uh, that is, uh, I think, generally well recognized by many leaders in our region is the importance of uh, workforce development and how lack of development in that area can hold back our region. And so uh, the St. Louis Federal Reserve, I think has some interesting information on that that is probably valuable or worthwhile for all of us. So that's what uh, Gerard and I have been working on. If you could kind of save those dates and, and obviously if something comes up that's an emergency, uh, we will add some more, but that is uh, at least uh, for right now what we're looking at for, for the HUD schedule. So uh, we do have speakers down here and I think it's gonna be non-controversial. The alderman from the seventh has guaranteed me of that. So uh, we have a number of people down here for this. And so we'll give that uh, a couple minutes hopefully and then we'll go right into the um, uh, CDA presentation. I had previously promised that they would go first, so forgive me, uh, folks who are here for that. But Jack, do you want, uh, Alderman from the seventh, you want to step up and. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Um, what's in front of you is Board Bill 90, which is a simple rezoning bill. Um, if you look at the map on the back page of the bill, you can see the parcels we're talking about. Uh, this is the site of the bar known as the Great Grizzly Bear uh, down in Soulard, right at the corner of Menard and Geyer. Um, <laughs> Mr. Bill Stakovic, who's here today, uh, owns the parcels. He recently sold the bar, um, and as part of his, uh, you know, him consolidate, he's, he had these parcels, they were kind of both part of the bar before. The plan is to take that rear parcel, redevelop it into a, a multifamily building. There'll still be a bar remaining in the front. Uh, and at the request of Bill and his insurance folks and the zoning commissioner, Mary, who's here, Mary Burton, we are rezoning. This is dual zoned currently as DG, so multifamily and G, which is local commercial. We're simply rezoning it to D and H, H, which is area commercial district, uh, simply to make the bar a basically a permitted use. Um, the new owners of the bar who took over for Bill had to apply for a variance. It was kind of a mess, you know, it was a cumbersome process that doesn't really need to exist for a property that we support that's always been a bar. So what we're hoping to do is just simply rezone from DG to DH. Mary's here if we need uh, any more information. Um, uh, Madam Zoning Commissioner, you want to step up and... Um, if there's any questions of the committee, we'll go through the um, through the roll. Uh, Alderman Boyd, do you have any questions? No questions. Uh, Alderwoman Davis is not present. Um, Alderwoman Hubbard, any que no, no qu questions? I'm busy looking at stuff. I may have some later, though. Thank you. Um, Alderman Oldenburg. No questions. Alderwoman Boyd. No questions. Uh, hearing no questions, the chair will entertain a motion on board bill number uh, 90. I move to pass board bill 90 out of committee with a due pass recommendation. Second. Previous roll. It's been moved by the alderman from the 22nd, second, seconded by the alderwoman from the 27th. And um, um, excuse me, yeah. and with the previous roll, alderwoman Hubbard wasn't included. Oh. Yeah. I withdraw my request for previous roll. Oh. Okay, so it's been moved and seconded. Uh, there's no request. Uh, so, Madam Clerk, call the roll. <laughs> I'm mumbling up here. <laughs> Alderman Boyd. Aye. Alderwoman Davis. Alderwoman Hubbard. Aye. 
Alderman Kotor. Aye. Alderman Spencer. Alderman Oldenburg. Alderman Boyd. Aye. Chairman Brody. Aye. Six aye votes. Okay. Uh, now we are going to have a uh, presentation on affordable housing. I, um, I'd like to spend a couple of minutes waxing poetic every time. I'd like to remind people why we're down here. The, the HUDS committee has adopted a mission statement where we are pursuing economic development for the, uh, to encourage or uh, sustain, create economic sustainability or viability for the city. And then also to, um, grow the uh, economic well-being of our residents. Those are not necessarily mutually uh, com uh, completely congruent goals. They, there's a lot of overlap, but the, you can have a very prosperous city and have it inhabited by people who are not doing particularly well or vice versa. And, and our goal is, is to find the right balance where we have a city that is uh, properly funded to provide vital services, whether it's education, police, forestry, and so forth, and yet also have that inhabited by people of growing incomes. And of course, we have a disproportionate share of the regional's income. Uh, to kind of reflect on where we want, we, we started the whole process with uh, a, a review of incentive reform. The next step was the development of an economic development strategy and we're coming close to, to the end of that and then the uh the next step of this is, is starting to pay some attention to the well-being of our residents and i think uh it is well acknowledged that uh a good and quality housing is uh the cornerstone of people's uh well-being and so um there has been a, a considerable amount of discussion uh, what I really want the committee to do is, is we're going to have a presentation on the RFP that goes out today. But as we discuss housing, and I've been very fortunate, as I think you all know, that I have a ward that's undergone great transition. There are a number of um, challenges and, uh, that need to be addressed. And uh, we end up with situations where I think most of us, all of us would agree that segregation is not a good thing, but we're segregated. To end segregation, that means either we're gonna to have to have people in segregated neighborhoods move out of it, which then can be called displacement, or we're gonna have people not in those segregated neighborhoods to move in, which then could be called gentrification, and then we end up in a situation when, we, when neighborhoods that have experienced a great deal of disinvestment are reinvested, uh, what is success and what does it look like? And are there better ways of creating affordable housing? If you go ahead and a neighborhood becomes, if you fix the problems of the neighborhood, if it becomes safer, if it becomes more attractive, more people are gonna wanna live there and home values are gonna go up. And there are lots of those kind of uh, conflicting results. And we need to figure out, and our goal in doing this is first to try to build consensus in the community. Uh, uh, I, we're gonna hear from the executive director over at CDA. And the way that we've designed the RFP is to try to go out and get as many people involved in this as we can so that we can develop consensus. But if we're developing consensus out in the community, at some point, we need to go ahead and ratify that. So I want us to kind of stay on a parallel path of what work is being done over at CDA so that when we're done with it, we can come back over here and adopt a resolution uh, and, and the findings of this study. And that can become kind of our shared vision of what success looks like and that will become our roadmap for how we go about doing our neighborhoods. There, there are many, many other kind of uh, conflicting things here that need to be sorted out. So with that, um, um, my understanding uh, is, is that the folks over at CDA have done a fair amount of work on this already and, and they've issued this, uh, the RFP for it last Friday. And uh, at this juncture, uh, we'd like to go ahead and recognize uh, our new executive director, first time before our committee, Matt Moak. I think most of us know Matt from his uh, previous position. Matt, why don't you go ahead and step up and walk us through what you've done. Good morning, committee. I'm Matt Moak, CDA, I know most of you. 
um, as Alderman Rohde has uh, alluded to. Um, CDA is taking a strong look at affordable housing in terms of what we've done in the past and what we may do in the future. And in that regard, I've prepared a small PowerPoint to present to you all today. Um, I'll be probably looking this way a little bit to the extent you can't hear me here behind. Please speak up you and might let me know. Pull the mic up a little closer. Okay. There you go. Is that better? Yeah. Okay. All righty. Let's take a look. Um, again, I I want to get into a little bit about uh, the, the parameters of affordable housing and how we have to uh, abide by HUD rules and different things we have to do. Some of the data, mostly historical, and then looking ahead to the future, meaning uh, the RFP on affordable housing that uh, the chairman alluded to. So the overall questions, you know, what are we doing in this area? How much more do we need to do? Where is it appropriate? Um, how do we go about doing that? Uh, and that's just an overall theme as we head into this today. Uh, the definition of HUD affordable, you see it there, um, at or below 80% of area median income for a family of four, the 65050. As we get into this a little bit today, you will see some of the numbers on that and uh, get into that in some detail. Just a note below about some HUD projects require set asides for even low, lower amounts of AMI. So here's the guidelines themselves. You can see I've sort of zeroed in on the family of four number there, the 65050, which is an 80% number uh, considered moderate income by HUD. But we're going to spend a lot of time up on this row today. And family size coming across. And again, the family of four in the scenario I'm talking about would be 4650 would be the income. Let me. Let me do this. So with that in mind, I, I mean, this number just strikes me, and I think it's, it's really the reason we're all here talking about helping these people in the city. But 44% of the city population is at or below 50% AMI. I, that's just amazing to me. We're talking about this row right here. So again, taking a family of four, that's our number. 65% of the city are between 50 to 80 percent MMI. It's a little bit more positive. Again, it just takes into account. We can go all the way up. To, you know, the numbers get a little higher. Something that we're proud of at CDA, we're serving that low to moderate income strata. And 85% of our money is directed to the low and mod activities in 2018. We're required by HUD to spend 70% in those areas, but we're actually doing 15% better than that. Just some background, uh, we're one of, CD is one of several entities producing house, affordable housing in the city. There's some other ones you're all mostly familiar with, I'm sure. Related to affordable housing, I'd be uh, neglectful if I didn't mention the other housing programs that we do at CDA that promote people being able to stay and maintain their homes. Uh, and these are three programs that we do. We spend quite a bit of time in with the healthy home repair and the lead remediation. I'm not necessarily coming back to that today, but the housing production I am. Because certainly the housing production, as we talk about affordable housing, this committee is, is the biggest uh, relevant topic. Again, just some background on how money comes into CDA um, from HUD, uh, various program funds. Most of you are probably familiar with some of these terms. The CDBG, everybody knows. The home is another sort of variation on that where uh, home funds are used strictly for housing production, whereas the CDBG can be used for some housing production, but also social services in the community, which is probably best known for. The NSP funds date back to the uh, economic mortgage, mortgage crisis of some almost 10 years ago now where we actually required property at HUD's uh, request through HUD funding and we're still working on getting some of those developed. Generally speaking, there's a lot of emphasis at CDA on these two paragraphs right here. I mean, certainly uh, these are considered, I guess, purpose statements, if you will, and our ability to get inside 
neighborhoods, provide affordable housing, but to also stabilize those neighborhoods through our other activities and try to remediate, of course, overall blighted areas. Um, we'll see some more on this today, but uh, certainly gap subsidy is a theme that we see and will continue to see in the city of St. Louis for some time. Uh, essentially where uh, the appraisal doesn't meet what it's going to take to build something and we step in and do gap financing and of course that's a big part of what we do. Uh, you, most of you probably know the history but in 2014 HUD changed rather dramatically the way CDA was going to approach funding housing production in other areas as well and at that time we morphed into what we call a NOFA or notice of funding availability, which is a fancy word for uh, having a certain sum of money from HUD and putting effectively an RFP out in the public arena for developers and builders to reply to and uh, propose projects they may do. One certain benefit of the NOFA process that we did not have prior to 2014 is like an RFP, it's out in the, it's out in the public, it's very transparent, it's competitive, uh, it's partially driven by what we refer to as a market value analysis, which identifies uh, parts of town and that need particular attention. Uh, helps us prioritize uh, our process. In that regard, we're down here doing these things every day. You know, identifying the neighborhoods where we think we can have the most impact, coupling the public money with the private money, figuring out ways to make projects happen. both for sale and rental housing are considered an ANOFA. And again, this is just a, kind of an obvious list of people that might uh, apply for money to do building pursuant to ANOFA. We're looking at each of the applicants, of course, and determining whether or not uh, the proposal, or we rank them, for lack of a better word, depending on the proposal, we've, which one we feel like is uh, more appropriate than another go through a process of doing that internally and of course work with the aldermen and others to figure out the best way to go. Some other um, just sort of details about how we go about prioritizing our housing production here, things that we look at. Um, obviously if we have contiguous city owned parcels or something magic we can make there, we try to do so. Uh, the type of materials that get used become, it's, some are more favorable than others. Um, let's see what else we have here. Mixed income is a big priority for us. You know, we always we're trying to be inclusionary in the way we build housing. So that's a that's a, more than just a moniker. That's something that we look at. Uh, obviously, we hear from the community about what they're seeking to do, and um, that's how we go about doing it. Just a little bit more on the NOFA, it's relatively new, having started in 2014, but uh, it's not like we're leaving developers and builders out there on their own to figure out what to do. Uh, we do quite a bit of training through workshops uh, where the uh, builder, potential builder, can come in and learn how we approach things like this and uh, uh, try to be competitive and try to get in line for some of this money to do good projects. Here's some of the numbers from in the last up to 18, I have 14 through 18, uh, almost $28 million in money awarded for projects. And here's some of the breakout of some of those projects that um, we've done, all affordable housing. This is actually a good number too, I think. Just in the last four years, we're talking about total development number of which we have been a piece of 237 million pursuant to the NOFA process. So some numbers, please locate your ward. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, it kind of runs down the left here, but this is actually a long period of time that we have. I only have it through 16 at the moment in the last 26 years. But I think it's interesting to look at the CDA money that's gone and the total development cost in the ward. Here's the number of units, of course. And uh, just to look at, again, I'm coming back to the gap subsidy kind of comp concept here of uh, how CDA pitches in to make these projects happen. And you can see here's 50%. You know, it goes sometimes lower. Uh, it's, it's interesting to note in some of the wards, like in the fifth ward, and 
1,858 units created over that period of time. It's pretty substantial. And you, you know, used to come down and take a look at that. Oh, by the way, I just should have mentioned this at the outset, I guess, but of course you have the slides with you if you'd like to just follow along with this uh, and by looking at them later or, or however you choose. Just the same way, of course, we're going down to the 28th, total 28 wards. You see the total number of units, the CDA number, well, it's dramatic. The total, total development cost is also dramatic. And then overall, we're pitching at about 17% on this affordable housing production consistently since over the last 26 years. So the other document that was handed out by Terry earlier is an RFP document with Alderman Rohde was referring to earlier. Uh, and I refer to it here as the future. Um, obviously, we're out there doing affordable housing in housing production, as I've talked about. But I think one of the things that we need to focus on is how we're going to be effective with affordable housing in the future. And we spent quite a bit of time over the last several months drawing up this RFP. And if I figure out the best way to get not just a report with data, the data is important, but to get some semblance of a strategy or a policy that we want to adhere to as a city moving forward and, and uh, do better. So in the next several slides I have here, I uh, really just uh, cut and pasting out of the RFP that you have there in total. It's a 14-page RFP to give you an idea of what we're trying to do. This is some basic background. Again, I think we're not just talking about a study and, a, and, and data. We do want that, um, but we also want, we want to articulate a strategy going forward. And I think that's what distinguishes this RFP from prior data RFPs. Nothing wrong with data. We do it, we'll continue to do it probably on an annual basis, um, but we just don't want to be strapped to that. Overall, um, I'll have to tell the committee, but there's, uh, there's concern about affordable housing in the city, and I think we need to be smart about it, and we need to focus on it, and really take a hard look at it, and that's uh, sort of a uh, objective slide, if you will, in terms of what we need. Some of the goals summarize here in terms, again, I've sort of been over them already, but I think the biggest thing we're doing, we'll talk to it a little bit about it today, is um, entertaining a consultant, of course, to come in and help us get this done, who would work with a, what we're calling a city housing panel. It's mainly these agencies here. I'll come back to that in a second but also um, an outside advisory group uh, yet to be assembled, and the consultant will help us assemble that. And the idea there is to get academics and professionals in the community uh, to be a part of this process and really uh, give it a global feel in terms of what we're going to do in this area going forward. Well, the city housing panel, sort of the usual suspects, if you will, uh, but I think the feeling is, too, we would like to have a representative from HUDs on the, on the housing panel. And I left this open down here, other appropriate city representatives, because, frankly, I, I don't, I don't want to limit this. Uh, there may be other people we want to include in this internal to the city, and if so, we will do so. Now, the advisory group kind of makes this RFP unique, and I'd like to spend a little time on that. Again, uh, you know, kind of mentioned this already. The idea is to go outside, uh, maybe other public institution representatives, but also private institution representatives, get them involved. Obviously, we want to be diverse. We want to have representatives from different geographies across the city. It doesn't even necessarily have to be someone in the city. It could be someone um, outside the city who might be able to help our vision. If so, we want to enlist them. And it, you know, it, you get down here and you start talking about we just we want to look at the continuing housing need, meaning we want to look at everything from homelessness to home ownership and uh, rental availability, and examine the gamut of that in our city and figure out how we're going to proceed. Um, it sort of reiterates what we've already talked about, but I. Um, Again, yeah, just sort of reaching out with the idea that we might include the state of Missouri, LITEC people, um, 
possibly St. Louis HUD, you know, this is sort of a, it was a relates to homelessness and other issues that we have. Uh, we were, might reach out to the mental health board and get them to be a part of the group as well. From there, um, subcommittees may form and we figure out how we're gonna go through this process. And I'll get to the timeline in a minute, but certainly we're leaving adequate time here that we can uh, do this done in a thorough fashion. So the idea uh, is for the housing panel inside the city to be working with the advisory group as a collective um, to meet regularly, to talk about where we're at the outset, talk about the premises of what we're gonna try to do, what type of inputs we need, uh, where are we gonna go with this. I would say the RFP contemplates this, that this is somewhat of an open process. Uh, we want to get input and get direction from people who are knowledgeable in the field and then sort of figure out where we're going as opposed to having a set goal right here standing here today. Some of the uh, content, of course, we hope to obtain. There's going to be data, and there's going to be lots of data. Um, uh, we need that. I think what we contemplate is if we can do this properly, we would have a data report uh, that comes out of this that hopefully would be updatable on an annual basis pursuant to the strategy and policy that we develop. Again, just some sections of the RFP I'm citing to here, uh, talking about uh, what we want to include. Um, we would be neglectful if we didn't talk about affordability in the city of St. Louis and how income of city residents affects affordability. There's no question that's a big part of this and uh, will be included in the study. I mentioned it here. Uh, we have quite a bit of data already. Um, and we, of course, will provide that to the study in terms of our housing production and others, building permit data that can be included. I, I, again, I, th I think the data piece is, piece is very important, but I, I think you have to take that data and actually take it to the street and figure out how we're really going to move forward. And it seems to me the focus of this RFP is more on strategy and policy than it is on data, but you know, data is a part of it. Um, I mentioned this only because I think it's always interesting to look what we what we expect to be attached to the report um, because those are going to be the documents that uh, uh, form the basis for the data and as well as some of the analysis and so I mentioned them here. Schedule. So we issued the RFP last Friday on a CDA website. It's out on the City of St. Louis website as well. We're going to give it till November 15th to solicit proposals, uh, roughly 45 days, a little more than that, and uh, hopefully we'll get some good proposals in. The idea is toward the end of this year that uh, along with the consultant, we'd assemble the city housing panel and try to get the advisory group together as well and, of course, try to merge them and get going on this. So um, I said early, early 2020 is sort of the launching pad for this uh, with the idea that, because I, I didn't mention this earlier as I was going through, but, of course, public input is going to be a big part of this, and we value that very much. So I set that out here after we get these uh, panels assembled in terms of getting out and meeting in the community and getting their input as well, which would, of course, become part of the report. These dates set right now is a tentative submission, June, July of 2020. And I would hope we would be able to report back to the committee at some point after that time as to what we've accomplished. That's pretty much all I have this morning. Uh, Mr. Chairman, the committee, I welcome any questions. I do want to introduce, by the way, Bill Rata is Mr. Housing at CDA, so certainly any questions regarding housing production that uh, he's also available here to, to answer if you'd like. Um, uh, thank you, Matt, and uh, I want to express my appreciation. We've been wanting 
I, this has been a priority of mine for um, well, for about the last year or two, and and we're making some progress. And our former executive director of CDA abandoned us, uh, Alana Green, and took a position over at St. Louis Housing Authority. So we had a little bit of a setback, but. Um, uh, when Matt uh, took over, he jumped on it, and of course, uh, he's right. Bill has been, you know, I, I would say one of our, if not the most knowledgeable resource on affordable housing that we have in in the city. And Bill, thanks for many, your many years of service. Um, Matt, I can't stress enough the I think what the importance is of of addressing head on and, and making kind of the general public aware of the paradoxes that we talk about, you know, that I mentioned earlier, and there's many more of them. We as a city, it costs, uh, uh, do we want to go ahead and use pre precious housing resources to put affordable housing in areas that are already developed? Do we want to go ahead and use that resource to go ahead and stabilize areas that are more struggling? If you spend it in more struggling areas, are we in essence contributing to over impaction and, and future segregation. So these are all things that I don't know if there's a right or wrong answer, but I think we need to make sure that everybody's aware of what those issues are. And, um, you know, having some sort of consensus and shared vision on what success looks like when we're done fixing a neighborhood up is, is just, I can't tell you how important that is. Uh, we'll spend a whole lot of, if we, if we know what that is, before we get into it, it's a lot easier to deal with than have a neighborhood change dramatically and then afterwards say, oh my gosh, you know, you should have done it this way or that way. And uh, I, I'm gonna go through the committee and I'd ask you kind of reflect on um, how we can stay in tune with what this parallel effort so that while Matt is going out and, and his uh, working with these consultants and having public engagement, how we can go ahead and make sure that the, the product that they're producing is something that we're going to feel comfortable eventually adopting. Uh, just like we did with the, the incentive reform thing, we ended up with a resolution. You know, I don't think anybody thinks it's perfect, but it's kind of an amalgamation of our shared views. And we'd like to go ahead and try to do something, I think, similar to that, so that as we start going forward and seeing some, um, hopefully, continued redevelopment in some of the areas uh, surrounding the center corridor, that we have some sort of idea of what that shared vision is. So uh, I'm asking the committee members to reflect on that, and we'll go through, and if you want to answer to that, or else uh, uh, make any other comments. Alderman Boyd? Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Matt, for the presentation. Um, is there anybody here from HUD, the actual local HUD office, in the room? Um, no, I don't believe so. No, okay. I think Waters is our main contact. I didn't ask her to come over on this. We talked to her a little bit about it briefly. Okay. A few questions. Um, are there any set-asides for specific neighborhoods or commercial districts? Um, there are some um, specific lower um, income set aside that HUD places upon us. I'd be, I'd be shooting it from the hip to tell you exactly what those are. Um, but de depending on the type of funding mechanism, what we use. Right, currently we have a five-year plan in place, and I know we're working on the next five-year plan, right? Within, right? within the current plan, are there any set asides for commercial districts or neighborhoods specifically as far as priorities given through the RFP process. Yeah, you know, we've been having a discussion about the commercial corridors and uh, what we're trying to do is line up the five-year plan with the economic development plan that is being developed right now through SLDC and try to, I don't know about the set-aside piece of your question, mm -hmm. but to try to identify those commercial corridors that we think we can make a difference with uh, focus funding. The reason I brought that up is I know several years ago under the Slays administration, there was a set aside for like MLK. And this yeah. I don't know if that expired right. yeah. or if it was renewed or where we were on that and how effective it yeah. might have been. Again, I don't know about the set aside piece, but MLK, the, the corridor you mentioned, Alderman Boyd was specifically identifying the 2014 comp plan. And I, I think, and I've had these discussions here just in the last couple of weeks with uh, the ED consultants and others about 
I, and I think if we're going to identify a priority like we did, then we need to follow through on that mm -hmm. and actually try to address it in some way. And, and um, I'm not sure, I'm not saying there hasn't been any follow through, but I'm reluctant to identify them unless I do something special for them. And I, I don't, that hasn't been finalized in this year's con plan. I, I would be so. curious as to see a report from the inception of when that was talked about and what the outcomes have been to date. Mm -hmm. Could you get me that? Yeah, I mean, the, certainly the, the five-year plan is going to no, reflect no, 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 on no. the core. No, the reflection sorry. of the MLK corridor set aside. Mm -hmm. How okay. much money was it? What was done? Okay, Can I'd I have to get back that? on that, okay. but I'm happy to do so. Um, Data is a word that you like to use. I've picked it up quite a bit in your presentation. And data is good. Data tells a story. And what was enlightening to me in your presentation, uh, I'm going to go to slide number 12, where it talked about the historical data, affordable housing production. Okay. And how you can easily tell where there's almost no low-income housing, like in the 12th Ward, there's zero dollars spent, the 16th Ward, zero dollars spent, the 23rd, just over 38,000, the 24th Ward, just over 1.1 million, and surprisingly in the 28th Ward, only 531,000, which really surprised me with data from 1994. Mm -hmm. uh -oh. So. What I would like to request, hopefully you can pull this, with redistricting, these numbers are totally skewed. Because some of the good work that was done in one particular ward with housing production, it got transferred to a different ward over time, yeah. right? Yeah, well, that's true. Is yeah. there a way that you can actually drill down to the neighborhood which would make more sense yeah. and be more accurate? I don't know. Uh, I know that quite a bit of effort prior to my uh, tenure was put into these numbers through 2016, but the methodology, we'll get inside that methodology and yeah. see what we can do. I, so I know the I, easiest thing to do is ward. I know Alderman always yeah. like to have those numbers for our wards, but right. I think if, if we really want to tell a, a good story, yeah. we should really get down to the neighborhood. Yeah, it's a lot of numbers, but not a lot of specificity. Um, I, I noticed on your housing panel, which has a lot of um, good people identified or agency identified. I'm just curious as to why no one from HUD is identified to be on the panel. Would that be a conflict? Because and the reason I say that is we oftentimes get pushback from HUD on ideas that we create. And I was just thinking if they're in the process, they can say, hold up, guys, that's a lot, that sounds good, yeah. but you're not going to be able to do that. No, that's a good Rather suggestion. I think it actually path. might be in the RFP, Alderman, but uh, I didn't necessarily summarize it on the slide. But, uh, you know, our feeling is we're open. I don't think it's conflict. Okay. I think it's more we're open to any type of outside support from public or private that we can get on this. So, well, yeah, including HUD, that's a good this idea. Is their money. Um, one of the challenges that I have and from the local office is I'm told that they don't want to oversaturate a lot of low income into a one particular geography, right? Yes. But then on the opposite end, I think if you live in the 16th ward, because of your census, your block group, you don't qualify to get affordable housing dollars, right? right? Generally not. So That's it's like, correct. how can you on one hand say, we don't want to put all this affordable housing in one particular area, but it would be nice to have some affordable housing in the far south side neighborhoods. Yeah. Not that the people over there may want it or not. I can't speak for them, but I'm just saying, if, yeah. you, if I'm going with the theory that they have. You've just yeah. identified one of the, that's right, a, exactly one of right. the paradoxes that I, you know, these, we, we end up with these paradoxes that, you know, are logically inconsistent. And at some point you have to. Yeah, how do you resolve Bring, bring that? those up. You know, and head front and center and make people aware of that. And I would love to have a conversation with HUD publicly about that. Yeah. Um, so that we know. Okay. Great. Because I, I like the idea. I like putting a strategy together. But I don't want to run into a roadblock because we do all this good work. And then HUD says, oh, guess what? You know, that's probably not going to work within yeah. our guidelines. So okay. thank you. Okay, you're welcome. No further questions. Uh, Alder Woman Hubbard, any questions? Thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, members of the committee. Um, I have some of the uh, same comments my colleague from the 22nd has. Um, when you look at, like, the Fifth Ward and, and their numbers, I, I know that uh, although the need may be there, I think that it has had an adverse effect 
on the community because we, we all know too well that if you have a, a high concentration of uh, low income impoverished people in an area and you create this public housing corridor, which, which is what has happened for some time uh, throughout the city, then things don't really work out. I mean, uh, me being a product, product of public housing, my family has been there five generations, it would have made my life a little bit better had I seen um, people of a higher economic background. You know, if we had that mixed use in the neighborhood instead of having O'Fallon Place, Murphy Park, Car Square, Cochrane. You know, so we, we, I mean, we have very few homeowners, uh, maybe St. Louis Place and Old North. Other than that, it's a public housing corridor, and we know that that model doesn't work, and it has us in a position where we have the highest numbers uh, for everything. That's why that particular area was awarded a prominent zone designation, a, ch a choice neighborhood designation. And so I think it's time for us to revisit it, although I would like to see more growth and development in uh, the Fifth Ward. Right. But I think that we need to look at it in totality to see what, what would best work in that community because we've, we've done the public housing corridor stuff far too long, and, and it, it, it hasn't worked. And so I think... Um, we need to really look at that because one of the a very adverse effects of it is that you don't have many stakeholders. Um, just the whole public housing process is a transient process. You have people that move into our community, they get these HUD vouchers, and then they're gone somewhere else. And so you don't have people who are vested in the community because you don't have um, a lot of homeowners and stakeholders there. So I think that's something that we definitely need to revisit and look at. And um, as my colleague from the 22nd uh, said that other wards may not want the yeah. uh, public housing or the low-income affordable housing, but I mean, if the data in our city calls for it, let, let's spread it out. And that, that way you can um, kind of, you know, look at different neighborhoods and, and have some different stuff going on. That's how you build a population and people begin to emulate some of the successes and stuff that they see. But if you have just a, a low income housing corridor and people are seeing everybody not do anything every day and they're living off the system and they don't have any role models, then that creates a problem. And that's part of the reason uh, that we are in some of the situations that we are in today. So I'm looking forward to having these continued conversations and seeing how we could uh, fix the problem with addressing those needs, but just doing it in a strategic way that we're not uh, overly impacting a particular neighborhood. I agree, older woman, completely with your statement. And I think that what compels me about this particular study is trying to move beyond just building a public facility and housing for people. And, and you're right, the Fifth Ward has had, it's, just a, it's been the pattern. I, I get that. I, I think we've got to get beyond that. I don't know if you want to call it spreading it out across the city, you know, whatever you want to call it. I look at it like mixed use, I look at it like inclusionary housing, but the idea of focusing it in, in one type of housing, particularly public housing in one place, it, we got to get beyond that, there's no question. Thank you, and I don't have any further questions. Thank you, Alderwoman. Uh, Alderman Kotar. Thank you, Chairman, I'll be brief. Uh, Mr. Moak, thanks for your presentation, very informative. Um, I guess piggybacking on what Alderwoman Hubbard said, you know, I, I can think of a project and you know, I represent a ward that's fairly developed. We do a lot of LIHTC projects. We do, which I don't, that's, the LIHTC and actual public housing is not included in your chart on page 20. No, I just, it, it will be, of course, con considered. I mean, I think when we look at how we're doing affordable housing, we're looking at the other incentives. We're looking at everything that's involved in the private sector or the public sector. I just didn't get down that much in the weeds. These today. are CDA projects. Mm -hmm. on, along those lines, you know, one of the things that I hope the we can focus on and the report will focus on is you know some of the when you're these cda projects in particular when you talk about people think about low-income housing and in some neighborhoods they say no i don't want this but mm. you know if 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 cda is providing gap financing to to help you know fill the void in in, right. in some areas where housing prices aren't quite as high i mean when you talk about low income i mean this low mod income i mean these there are cops and firefighters and many city employees that would fit into these categories that'd be eligible to buy these homes. And, and I know that's worked really well in my ward. We've done some of those mm -hmm. projects with CDA's help over mm -hmm. in McKinley Heights, and it's been a huge success. But there was a big barrier we had to get over with the neighborhood to yeah. get them to understand that this was, this was going to be a good thing. These are going to be quality right. homes, right. well built, and... And, and would be really a benefit to the neighborhood, and they've turned out to be. But, I mean, that was a very challenging process. It took 
frankly, years to get the neighborhood on board with that. Yeah, uh, your comments kind of tie into Alderman Hubbard in a way, because there's a perception, of course, that can be very negative, and I think we're, we're doing something to overcome that. And of course, we've done our share of new construction as well. It's not all in the poorest parts of the city. There are other parts of the city where we have been able to make an impact through certain programs, but you're right, we've got to overcome the perception somewhat. Yeah, well, I appreciate your work and look forward to okay. working with you on the committee here. Um, Alderman Bird everybody. stepped out, and uh, he is our affordable housing expert. So, uh, um, and I think the president had a couple questions, um, but he had to leave. Um, he, he, he did ask me if I could ask my question on his behalf. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Alderman Boyd's going to ask the question. Yeah, the president you. asked me, uh, do you have um, data on what you plan to do over the next year, you know, and what the current disbursements have been? Well, um, we're developing it. And uh, by that I mean um, RFP for CDBG money was issued in for the month of August, and we presently have the proposals that's mainly social service money, but also includes minor home repair and some different things that we do, public services, uh, some development of commercial public facilities for that matter. And I expect that determination uh, to be made at what we're going to fund and not fund here in the next week or two. Um, obviously, we'll see the committee next week because the appropriation bill for this year's uh, appropriation is going to be coming to the committee next week. So we're going to be making those decisions very soon. Matt, how much money currently do we have to allocate for this RFP? For which piece? Um, no. The next round of housing production. Um, I want to say we're looking at four and a half million. Does that sound like the right number that we were talking about yeah. the other day? To do, uh, to do housing production in uh, 2020. Okay. And the next NOFA... Notice of funding is going to come soon. I actually don't have a date for you on that, Alderman, but uh, it's something that we're going to tackle here after we get the appropriation done. It'll be my guess is November. We'll be putting that out there. Yes. I get a lot of requests from individuals, individuals who maybe they bought an LRE piece of property and mm -hmm. they want to know if they can get support from the city to kind of help rehab it. Is there a program to uh, rehab single-family homes for a home ownership or even for rental? Oh yes. Um, mostly subject to the income guidelines, but yes, that's, uh, we're doing that um, it, mainly pursuant to the NOFA, mainly, uh, which, uh, which, you know, of course, like I said, will be issued the next month or so. Do you uh, know when the last time we funded a single unit development for, let's say, a homeowner that just wanted assistance or rehab? <laughs> I'm going to ask Bill. Yeah, it's been a while. <laughs> Microphone, Bill. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's been a while since we've done that. Um, the the difficulty is for an uh, individual homeowner to comply with all of the HUD requirements mm -hmm. that they want with a project funded with their housing. So you know, <laughs> you have to have an architect. You have to bring it up to Energy Star standards. You know, lead remediation, asbestos, radon. Um, a bunch of different things like that. Section 106 compliance. Mm -hmm. So it, it's it's. It can be done, but it's kind of difficult for, you know, an individual homeowner to go through the NOFA process. What makes it difficult? Just complying with all the HUD uh, requirements and... But if they hire somebody to do the lead They could, to do all right. Um, but then, um, you know, they have to have some skin in the game. Mm -hmm. So we're not going to do 100% financing. Right. So, you know, we generally like to do no more than 50% of the total development cost. So... If the development cost is say 150,000, mm -hmm. you know they're going to have to have 75,000 dollars. Right. So that that's, that's not, the biggest hurdle. And that's not a bad deal, 50 percent. You know, I came into housing development through support of CD8, rehabbing a four-family to a three-family. But I'm just haven't been aware in the past 10 years of any, you know, small type development being funded through CD8. <laughs> right. It's not really ideal for that to happen. It, it can, but it's difficult. Okay. Well, let me ask you this, Bill. You know, we have this Prop S money. Not Prop S, I'm sorry. NS. NS, thank you, old woman. This, that we can use up to $30,000 for a LRA house, right? <coughs> Could a, 
individual who wants to move into a particular neighborhood, leverage, let's say, $25,000 of that money, and then qualify for potentially 50% of the, what's remaining through CDA? That's an interesting concept because my understanding with that is those are vacant buildings right. currently, right. so th that stabilization would d be done beforehand. But the idea is to, to kind of preserve them so they can be developed at a future date. Yeah. I, I, I don't want to rain on yeah. it. Uh, I, we have another bill, oh, and I, uh, we're kind of talking about legislation, I think, that's going to be before us next week, and we have a, a number of people waiting here. So I, are, are you okay? Thanks, Bill. Okay. <laughs> I, want to, I, I, need my, I need my votes on my committee members, so I don't want to get too cruel like the president does and cut people off at, during the debate. Joking, Mr. President, who wants to ask some questions himself. But um, uh, Alderman Oldenburg, did you have any questions? I did. Before? Okay, no questions. Mr. President, did you have any questions? Uh, Alderman Boyd just <laughs> asked my question okay. about NS, so I'm Okay, good. I, th Thanks. I think we're just about wrapped up with this. Uh, Matt, can you give us your schedule? You're going to be before us again with a couple different things, are you not? Um, so. to have the appropriation board bill before the committee next Wednesday. It is not introduced yet, of course, not done yet. So, <laughs> Clerk, it's okay when he, as soon as you get it, just go ahead and introduce it, but you'll need to get that okay. in. Yeah, the, he, he indicated, of course, I haven't been introduced yet. We could still discuss it next week, and I thought that was fine, but I told him I'd have him the appropriation bill by Tuesday noon. We, uh, by, by tradition, at least since we've done these changes, we go ahead and have the first hearing on that, wait two weeks, and then pass it out. So we'll have the second hearing on that. Is it one week or two? We, we agreed. <laughs> no, we talked maybe about. Maybe it was one week. The yeah, we, I know we talked about the 16th because coming you back. Have some deadlines, so it'll be back. Yes, on the that was the feeling. Is it maybe we'd be, could be introduced next Friday, but discussed next Wednesday, okay. not this Friday, the following Friday, be introduced, and then we would come back on the 16th and hopefully vote it out of committee. Does that sound okay? Right. Okay. On the 16th, we will also be having Angie Banks, and then there's a possibility yeah. that we are going to have the consultants who are updating the MBA, and they may be here as well. We put that on your calendar to expect that as well then. Let me ask the committee about that, because uh, the market value analysis, the uh, last one we did was in 2014. It's a very fascinating study. It's done by a outfit out of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. They did our last one. They did this one, too. Um, it's going to be finalized on November 1, but they have a draft version of the market value analysis that they sort of tend to lose shown CDA and SLDC. But I thought maybe the committee might want to see that. Um, and so I mentioned this to Alderman Rohde, but it, if I'm going to bring them in from Philadelphia to do a presentation, I'd say it's probably 45 minutes long. I think the board would, uh, the, the committee would enjoy it. Um, but I need to tell them. So we talked about bringing them in on the 16th to say 10:30 in the morning, uh, you know, after the other business has been conducted by the committee and putting it on. But I, I did want to ask about that today because I need to, I need to either bring them in at a time certain or no. So I wanted to get a feel for that. So just from a standpoint of scheduling, the reason I'm trying to get this all ironed out for us as you start planning your schedule ahead of time. That will be a long day. Angie Banks is down here, um, who's already been scheduled. Uh, she, I've committed her to the first slot. And then this would be the uh, second presentation. We, I wasn't really planning on this when I did this schedule initially, but then when, when uh, our director told us that that was a possibility, I wanted to bring it before the committee. And then uh, also on the 16th, we will have um, uh, the voting on the block grant bill. We know that. And we will also have the, um, um, uh, the older woman from the 11th bill will be back down here. She is unavailable on the 9th. So we'll be probably taking that bill up, Board Bill 88. And I don't know if there's anything from SLDC or not for that yeah, day. So if you're kind of sitting there thinking, well, Angie Banks will take a half an hour, the MVA may take a half an hour, or 45 minutes. I'd say 45, I mean, I and then, uh, that's what. Uh, mm -hmm. So we will have a full hour or so in, more than an hour, before we even get over to the board bills. So um, 
pack a lunch. Uh, yeah, uh, if we do, uh, is, what's the sense? Does the committee would like to hear MV8? You buying lunch. <laughs> uh, I was hoping that the old man from the seventh who's making all those big legal bills. Uh, I'll bring lunch. Uh, uh, is it the will of the committee to go ahead and hear MVA? I mean, yeah. Yeah. I'm fine. I think so. I'd like to hear. Yeah. 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 Okay. So we'll have them through. It'll be a long day, but if possible, schedule. If not, we understand. Would you like to show, we need to talk to her about scheduling for 1030? Is that sort of, I Yeah, mean, I would say I, it's, I would have them here by 1030. It's probably, you know, we always start a couple minutes late. Yeah, and then right, right. We'll try to keep um, okay. the school presentation down. Okay. Uh, you know, reasonably short. So. Um, I should be able to get that accomplished. They've offered the 15th through the 17th as days to come in. But I'll let you know for some reason it doesn't work out. Otherwise, I was planning on the 16th at 10:30 having the MVA people here. And I'm sorry. Well, we have a, a the copy of the, I guess their draft um, report in advance of that. Are you are you going to share that with us, or can you? I don't have. I've had it shown to me through okay. PowerPoint, but I don't have a document. If I can get my hands on it, sure, ahead of time. Is that what you're? Either thinking? the PowerPoint or something, just so we can familiarize yeah. ourselves and. Yeah, let me talk to them questions. about that. Okay. I, I just, right now, I'm just trying to set up the travel arrangements, so I'll see if I can get that done. Mr. Chair, could we make sure that Ways and Means doesn't schedule a meeting on that day? I can't, could, I can't tell the that, <laughs> chairman. Because uh, there's going to be a lot, you know, yeah. it'll be back and forth or something. Are, are they meet, do they typically yeah. meet on the... Because we just left them over there. Oh, okay, yeah. they're over there now. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, you know, I can ask the chairman of Ways and Means, but, I, you know, obviously it's his prerogative. Okay. Um, thank you, uh, okay. Mr. Welcome aboard, incidentally, and uh, uh, thank you for your time this morning. Okay. Um, next up is the uh, second, uh, second uh, piece of legislation, and that is uh, Board Bill Number 103. I'm in the... Uh, uh, unenviable position of, of having a fair amount of legal discussion and uh, an awkward position of not necessarily knowing or understanding completely the intricacies of all of that. But um, the older woman from the fifth, uh, I, I, you know, wanted to make sure I try to make sure everybody's board bills are heard. And uh, certainly she has been a stalwart supporter of development in the city. And I think we are all wanting to do whatever we can. Um, to try to have some development occur north of Del Mar. And um, um, I certainly wanted to make sure that she had her time in front of our committee. So, um, um, Alderwoman, if you want to proceed. <coughs> thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, members of the committee. Uh, I first would like to thank you for your efforts uh, in regards to getting this scheduled again. It, it has been a, a trying process just to get everybody together and um, to get some movement on this particular project. If, if I may, I would first like to do a brief summary of the board bill and then uh, defer and give a few people some time to speak who have another uh, appointment slowly after and then I can come back and then we can fully present the board bill and then uh, take any questions. So I'm here on behalf of board bill 103. Uh, it's a health works hospital project. This board bill authorized the execution of an amended and restated parcel development agreement for the Health Works Hospital Project, Ordinance 70525 and Ordinance 70526, approved tax increment financing assistance for the development of a three-bedroom hospital, expandable up to 103,000 square feet with a 24-hour emergency room and associated roads and public infrastructure improvements, Ordinance 70525 authorized the execution of a parcel development agreement for the Health Works Hospital Project. Ordinance 70526 authorized the issuance of TIF notes in the maximum principal amount of $8 million plus cost of issuance. As authorized by this board bill, the amended, stated, restated parcel development agreement amends certain dates and add, add certain parties as co-developers. So basically what, what that's saying and what we have here before us is a, an agreement that was already passed in the future. I, be, I mean, uh, in the past, I think it was like maybe two years ago or so, and um, it had a, a, a lot of support. And what we have before us today is just us changing 
some of those dates and changing some of the partners. Um, I know some of my colleagues are familiar with this project. It's one that we've been working on a long time, uh, over five years. And so what I'd like to do now is read a letter dated August the 15th, 2014. It was a letter that I myself wrote to William uh, Crodinger. He's the chairman of the Missouri Health Facilities Review Committee. Uh, it was the Certificate of Needs Committee in Jefferson City, and I went and testified. It says, Dear Mr. Crodinger, please accept this letter offering my full support for the Northside Urgent Care Center. As an older person and lifelong resident of the Fifth Ward, I truly understand the need for health care in our neighborhood. As a mother, I have felt the void in our community when I've had to go across town to address the health care needs of my own child. As a resident, I have felt the impact that has been placed on my community because there is not one hospital on the entire north side of St. Louis. We have no access to 24-7 emergent or urgent care, and, com and my community suffers because of this. The north side has the highest rates of avoidable hospital admissions for congestive heart failure, hypertension, pneumonia, and diabetes. Within our community, we also have the highest percentage of Medicaid-eligible persons in the entire city the highest mortality rate, the lowest life expectancy, and have been identified by the city health department as the area with the greatest health care concerns. At one time, several hospitals served the north side. Since that time, they all left and our population left as well. In our effort to redevelop and transform the north side into a viable, workable, and livable community, we must have urgent emergent health care. I hope that you truly understand the needs of my community, and I hope that I can have your support. Sincerely, Tamika Hubbard, Fifth Ward Alderman. And so that's what we have before us today. Uh, this issue is, of course, one that's near and dear to my heart. Uh, we've been working on it a long time. Just to give you a, a brief history of this project, initially it was supposed to be uh, on the site where the new NGA will be built, but they um, needed more space, so then we hopped back across the street to the Pruitt-Igo site. Uh, we all know the history of Pruitt-Igo. is one of the biggest federal debacles in the history of this city. Um, uh, there, there is so much toxicity in that, on that footprint which requires brownfields that there will never be able to uh, be residential housing on that site. And so for us to work uh, very hard to get a hospital in, in North St. Louis, the only hospital in North St. Louis that uh, could really help because we don't have one at all, I think it's important that we kind of put our political differences aside and try to make this thing happen. I, I would surely hate for an ax to be granted on the backs of my constituents, some of my most vulnerable people in the entire city who, like I said, if you look at every demographic, they are the ones that are most in need. And um, I think what we're missing in regards to health care in St. Louis, and if you really want to put this in perspective of how important it is, people within my community and my ward, they don't even have access to public transportation. They can't afford public transportation to go on King's Highway to go to Bournes or, or Jewish or to go um, somewhere else to go to the hospital. So this, this is crucial um, for my neighborhood. Not only will it be an urgent care, it'll be a, it'll be a health care village. We have Ponce University. It's a health sciences university that has already come to St. Louis. They are currently operating uh, downtown, and they want to move on this site. We want to create a whole medical health care village. And it's my hope that we all can work together and figure out this technical part of it in regards to financing, because my constituents, they, they don't care about when the TIF started or you didn't meet these deadlines. Or they, they don't care about that kind of stuff. What I'm hearing at my doorstep every day is that we need to be able to go to the doctor. And so if we don't um, address these concerns, if we don't get through these legal loopholes, then we'll be doing a disservice uh, to the community. And so I'll, um, at this time, like to bring up State Representative um, Roberts to uh, offer some uh, Insight. He, he called me just understanding how important this project was and, and definitely wanted to testify. And then after that, I'll bring uh, up the other partners and everything so you all can feel some of the questions to myself and them. Thank you. Sure. Good morning. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and ladies and gentlemen of the committee. My name is Stephen Roberts. I serve as the state representative for Missouri's 77th district and as chairman of the Black Caucus for Missouri's House and Senate. 
I'm here to testify in favor of Board Bill 103 uh, to support the Health Works Project and to thank Alderwoman Hubbard for bringing this piece of legislation forward. Uh, I'll keep my comments brief. I know you have a lot of people you uh, plan on hearing from today. A uh, person's ability to access emergency health care can have a profound effect on every aspect of his or her health. An estimated 40% of residents living on the north side of St. Louis City do not have access to their own means of transportation, resulting in a high demand for city ambulance services uh, in North St. Louis. Uh, my mother is actually a doctor and my grandfather was trained at Homer G. Phillips Hospital before I was born and he served as a general surgeon before his passing. I have a particular interest to ensure that the residents of our city have immediate access to urgent care when emergencies arise. Uh, I can't tell you how invaluable it was to me and my family to literally have a doctor in the house. I actually remember um, my mother putting staples in my brother's head after we were playing a little too rough one day. Uh, given the planned development in the area, it's important that we have adequate medical facilities to care for our residents and I think that projects like this are what's needed. Um, in these uh, underserved regions of North St. Louis. And that really concludes my testimony for today, but I'd gladly answer any questions if there are any. Well, thank you for having me. Okay, and so at this time, uh, Mr. Chairman, if I may, I would like to um, take any questions or bring up uh, any any other partners who can definitely speak to some of the tips concerns uh, uh, what I, I think and I'm not sure how to best do this I, I have shared there's I guess some disagreement about um, what what the city can legally do or not do and uh, I'm not really sure who's the appropriate person who can give us kind of the crux of the Okay. Uh, I, I've, sh I've attempted to share with everybody, I hope uh, you've received in my email out a several letters that were sent out uh, back and forth. A and um, I think before we have lots of speakers, mm -hmm. I think some of the questions that we should be um, posing to them okay. is, is uh, their thoughts regard to this disagreement. Thank you, Mr. Thing. Chairman. And you're referencing, a, a, I guess, a legal opinion that was given by a, a city councilor, and and that's the first I've uh, heard of us trying the city's legal woes in a committee here in regarding a development project. But I, I, I guess maybe uh, Otis Williams could speak to that, or is the city councilor here that offered that, that opinion or their perception what, what, of what's... Would it be all right? All the women, I don't want to take, you know, I want to, don't want to take your, it's it's you know, fine. Your, I think okay, we should yeah. have both parties come up. He, he, I yeah. guess he can come up and then maybe they can okay. counter. Okay. Mr. Chairman, Otis Williams, SLDC. Uh, I'm not able to speak to the legal opinion uh, because I didn't render it. Uh, so I will defer to, uh, to the legal folks to do that. But suffice it to say, we have, uh, I call it dueling uh, opinions, and so it doesn't really matter about the, whose opinion is right. I think at, at the end of the day, there are two things that need to happen. Uh, one is that uh, we would have to uh, restate the redevelopment agreement uh, that is out there, and there would have to be a companion tip note ordinance that would have to be done. So uh, in its current form, it is not executable. That's, that is my, my point. But I, uh, there, there have been uh, a lot of things that have been said back and forth. And, uh, but let me start. And I think each time I've communicated, to, I think three times I've communicated with uh, uh, Mr. Piggy, I think I've said that uh, we are in support of this project. So it's not that we are not. But I would like to, I think a couple, couple of three things that uh, has been uh, what I call uh, the developer's argument, and one is that uh, North, North St. Louis needs a hospital. Uh, that ordinance 70525 authorized the use of area-wide revenues for uh, Northside, and uh, why should we change it now? And uh, the third was uh, uh, starting a new TIF would be, would adversely affect the funding for the project. And so let me just say this. Um, 
there, there was also comments made that uh, that uh, we were withholding TIF revenues because we were using we will be using those for the soccer stadium, and uh, unfortunately, I think that's just uh, sort of in inappropriate in that it's not possible for us to for us to do that as we are, are not uh, able to. Uh, uh, reallocate funds from the special allocation fund, but it does, th th these funds are are things that uh, are or can be done within the. When I say th th we use these funds uh, within the city of St. Louis, uh, but it's not to be used for uh, th these major projects. Uh, so I, I guess what I would say: t the TIF revenues absolutely, positively, will not be used for uh, for that project. Uh, uh, I, I'm speaking uh, partially for the mayor's office as well. That we, uh, want, she wanted me to let everyone know that she strongly supports the healthcare facility in North St. Louis, and that this project specifically, so long as it's undertaken in a, undertaken in a financially prudent manner, should be should move forward. Uh, but a lot has changed in the past two and a half years, uh, including the following. Uh, the city has terminated the redevelopment agreement for Northside uh, because uh, the developer has not followed through on many of the promises that he's made. Uh, uh, the developer has provided no evidence that phase two is feasible, uh, which was contemplated in the analysis that we did, and that the lapse of time has made it more likely that the uh, area-wide revenues will be required to support the project. So at this point, we checked. I checked just last night with the comptroller, and in the uh, special allocation fund is a total of eight hundred and sixty-two thousand dollars, I believe. Couple that with what this project would uh, generate, uh, we are at roughly uh, two point four million. The request is over six uh, for the first phase. And so a part of that request is for the facility, but also for the infrastructure that is supporting it. And so my uh, comment to that is that the, some, some of the infrastructure that would f fully develop the rest of the Puerto site can be deferred until they meet the criteria for showing that they have a legitimate project for phase two. Uh, so we are saying, yes, let's approve the phase one, uh, get it out of the ground, uh, get the phase two project generated. At that point, we can go in and uh, the project, I mean, the developer can then put in the infrastructure that is uh, supporting it that within the Pruitt Igo site. This project is located along Jefferson Avenue, can be accessed from Jefferson Avenue, uh, and can be parked those visiting can, can use it from Jefferson Avenue. There's no real need if there is a financial crunch at this point for, by, uh, by the developer. Um, the other thing that I wanted to mention is that this project works only if uh, area-wide uh, TIF revenues are counted on uh, to pay for the TIF. And this raises several questions. Uh, uh, where are those revenues going to come from? And how are other projects going to be incentivized if this project requires such a huge subsidy from uh, future unidentified uh, projects? Um, and when I say unidentified, I'm saying if phase two was further along and we had a sense of what the uh, financials would be for phase two and we could see that we could close, it could be counted on as a project in the future. But at this point, uh, as I, as I mentioned, over two and a half years has passed. Um, our uh, uh, confidence that uh, other projects will happen is very low in the sense that uh, this TIF was approved in 2009 because of the lawsuit. Uh, it was not actually uh, uh, started until 2013. And so since 2013, uh, just a few things have happened uh, to include the Greenleaf Grocery Complex, uh, and I'm not, there may be one other project out there that it, uh, that I'm aware of, but it, uh, not a lot has been generated to uh, to also provide for other funds within this alloc this uh, special allocation fund. The other part is: is it good 
public policy to have the city issue obligations for which uh, there is no identified source of repayment. Uh, that's one of the reasons uh, the city's bond rating was downgraded by Moody's. And so if you recall, uh, this board's, at this board's insistence, we uh, developed a model that we run every project through. We ran this project through the model at the very beginning. And I, I guess I must go back and say that uh, when the developer first came to us with the idea of doing the, this hospital, we ran the analysis and he, he, was, he was aware that phase one does not support it by, by itself. It was SLDC that came up with the idea of, well, we moved both of them together and if you can assure us that phase two is going to occur, then we can see how that might work. And so it was uh, SLDC standing here along with the developer and others who said, we can bet, we'll, we'll take a risk we will take a, take a bet on this project because we need to get something started. Uh, so that was t over two and a half years ago. And uh, since that time, I think we're now down to year 13 on the TIF. Uh, by the time this is constructed, we could be down near year 11. And according to the agreement, uh, if we give another two years for the uh, phase two to occur, then we're down to year nine. Uh, and I'm just saying that is, this, is it financially prudent at this point? Which is why we offered the alternative, which was to provide a uh, new TIF to support this. Which, in none of those scenarios, we're saying don't do the project. We're trying to be, be, make it uh, uh, financially feasible. So uh, phase one by itself does not uh, get a passing grade since uh, uh, we uh, since the existing redevelopment uh, area generates only about 924,000 uh, of TIF assistance. Uh, it could, if the board, uh, board of aldermen decided to provide the bottom half of the EATS, it could get up to about uh, 1.2, 1.3. Uh, if the developer can get financing for uh, both phases, and if phase two starts within two years of uh, completion of phase one, then the project does receive a passing grade and SLDC will support phase one and two as long as uh, they are payable solely from uh, site re revenues. And so um, uh, the, the thing that I want to be sure that everyone understands here is that one, we support the project, but two, we think it needs to be financially, financially feasible. Uh, and we think that the phase one project can actually get started if you are not trying to build the other infrastructure uh, that would provide for a fuller, a larger redevelopment of the, the site if the, if the sources and uses are what they say they are. So um, uh, this, this project could, could move ahead. Um, so can, can I stop thing. you for a second and sure. try to convert some of what you said I want to make sure I understand it, so uh, if... So, let me do this. Let me pass these out to, to you. So what you have in front of you is a chart that uh, is a summary on top, and essentially what it uh, provides is sort of a, if, and we did, we did about eight or nine uh, different scenarios, and I can bring Jonathan up uh, to uh, answer the specifics on each of those. But uh, try to summarize uh, phase one uh, using the existing uh, legislation uh, and what that impact is if you use 50% of the EATS and if you use 100% of the EATS uh, uh, to the city. Um, and what the request is. So um, obviously this board can, uh, can uh, approve uh, uh, whatever you, you choose to, uh, but it is our recommendation that uh, from a uh, 
uh, prudency of uh, financial, for financial prudency, I think you sh would uh, look at uh, the exposure that is to the city. Okay, okay. I, I want to make sure I understand exactly what's all transpired and what the issues okay. are and make sure, and, and uh, at least I know what's going on and then uh, we'll provide other people. So obviously we, we passed a TIF yeah, a number of years ago, lawsuit, slow start. So there's what, did you say 13 years left on that TIF? Is yeah, that so right? TIF was passed 2009. Uh, there was a lawsuit that was not settled until uh, 2013. At that point, uh, we all said uh, hooray, and we had a new start. We, I said new start in the sense that we could then get started. Uh, the alternative at that time was for the developer to, to restart or to just accept the loss of four years on the TIF. He chose uh, to accept the loss, and so the TIF clock uh, actually started in 2009, but by the time if, if, uh, the developer could actually get something done, it was 2013. Yeah, and just so for the benefit, so that was a TIF district, a TIF which district. meant that 1,500 the, acres. The anointed or the appointed developer, not anointed, appointed developer, um, uh, had some discretion over the use of new money that came out, came in through the whole district to support specific projects. Right. Uh, not complete carte blanche, but had some some authority. But, so, but and we did you do that for the Greenleaf project. We uh, provided I think about 1.8 million dollars of area wide. Okay. Funds so, to. So that was so they're taking money from you know uh, perhaps a project over here or the natural growth that was occurring in the area and they're able to re redirect that. So that was kind of how things were going, and then I guess the city and the developer. Uh, and during that period, this project was selected as one of the projects to receive some support from the area wide. Is that correct? Correct. In 2016, I think uh, we were having conversations and we realized that we really need to have some, something happen in the area positive. Uh, so along with Greenleaf, uh, we were supportive of doing the hospital. Uh, that was uh, 2016. Uh, the uh, legislation was ultimately approved uh, February of 2017. Okay, mm -hmm. and, and it's your contention that part of, uh, so part of that, the TIF amount request, the $6 million, a portion of that was going to be used to do the hospital, but then also some infrastructure Correct. that isn't necessarily required to do the first phase. In my view. I mean, in, the, in your view. In, in I, my view. Yeah. I just want to make sure what your side of the story, right. we're in the awkward well, situation. When, when I, say pref I think everybody on the committee would prefer that this all be worked out and we're not here, but we want to go ahead and out of courtesy to the alderman from the fifth, I want to make sure that we everybody at least understands what the issues are so um, so that's your contention is is that a portion of that could be delayed right then uh, subsequent to our passage of that um, the master developer uh, uh, was uh, I guess the city revoked the master developers agreement for lack of progress is that the proper terminology or is that uh, your I probably should get legal to give the proper terminology but essentially yes we did I, terminate okay uh, and so and that is a, a subject of litigation as we speak is correct. correct okay so that is the subject of litigation and I I, I don't want to go ahead and speak for the city councilors but I think his opinion is that if we revoked it then that makes this area this project null and void then is that I think he may have said that in his opinion, but I, I, I'm of the mind that because Mr. Piggy made uh, some valiant arguments as well, counter arguments, and so I'm not into that, uh, you know, this lawyer said it and this lawyer said it, but I said at the very end, though, at the bottom line, no matter which opinion you want to agree to, that we had to have a restated uh, redevelopment agreement and that we needed a separate TIF ordinance. Okay, and then... A TIF note ordinance. Okay, so assuming that then then the question is is the we have some money that's available from the 
aerial, uh, I, if I understood you correctly, I want to make sure that I do this, is, is that you had, what was it, eight or $900,000 that had been collected. It's right. in the special allocation fund. That's, that remains. Uh, all total over the, since 2009, um, uh, well, maybe it was 2013 when it was actually begun. Uh, a total of two, almost $3 million has been, uh, about $2.6, $2.7 million has been collected in the special allocation fund. So you can see that it doesn't collect at a rapid rate. And we then subsequently used uh, a portion of that to support Greenleaf. Okay, and there now we're. So, so now the balance is about 800000 And so th the request. Uh, your interpretation of the request of the developer is, is that we just kind of pick up where we left off, take the area-wide TIF revenue, apply that to the project, and that will help them. Uh, but, but I guess my point, my point is that even if you applied the area-wide, that you don't have sufficient funding at this point or commitment to be able to, to, uh, to make this, in my, in my uh, view, uh, okay. viable. Can you walk me through... Uh, uh, so I, I think, can you walk me through this thing here? So when you talk about phase one, that's existing TIF, the TIF revenue generated with 50% of the EATS, you're saying that's going to generate, what, 920000 900, About $925,000. Okay. And then how is it that we end up with negative revenue for the city if um, we... If that that's if we uh, were to fund it uh, totally. So it would be if you if you go to the maybe it's the next page. It's one of those where you show we, we show that uh, uh, both the city and the school district are both impacted by the uh, uh, by this. And so that's essentially the, this what the city's share of funding the uh, project. So if we were going to provide. If we were going to provide the six million dollars in um, in TIF fund and uh, and to support this project, uh, only nine hundred and twenty-five thousand is going to come from the project. So we've got to find revenue f to fund oh, the rest of it. So what you're saying is nine twenty. Nine hundred twenty-five thousand right. is from the project specifically, and that the other. Millions of dollars that are necessary is coming from the area-wide TIF. Then uh, it is coming from the area-wide plus the uh, uh, school board. So if you go to the uh, next page, there is, is number number one, and it shows the uh, phase one existing. It shows the model, and uh, Jonathan, maybe you can uh, speak to it. Go ahead. Before he speaks real fast, Mr. Trevor, I just want you to know this is the first we've seen of this. Right. We've been encouraging uh, conversations to go back and forth for a long time, and no one has looked at this until now. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. We're trying to, you know, we want to have some conversation, and if this generates some conversation and gets us to where we need to go, it's a successful meeting then. So uh, go ahead. Uh, yeah, good morning. Um, so. Can you restate the question just so I can answer well, I, I guess I thought I was always of the opinion that if we did a TIF, we wouldn't end up in negative revenue, but we sh it shows here over 10 years we've lost $2.2 million. Right. So what is going on here is um, the, uh, this is modeled in such a way where you have the 925000 that would come from the project, from the top half, uh, just using the top half of the EATS and 100% of the pilots. Um, in, in this uh, version of the analysis, we have a $6.4 million roughly um, TIF obligation that would be created um, because that is what is being requested by the developer. So um, essentially that difference, the $6.4 million minus the $925,000 has to come from the area-wide TIF. Um, the way that that works out in practice is that uh, if there are revenues there in that area-wide TIF, um, they, if they come at any point t down the road, whether it's from mm -hmm. development that would happen as a result of NGA or some other project, um, these notes would have to be paid off first. And so essentially what that means is that this is revenue that um, the city would ultimately lose from other projects um, before, you know, um, uh, before, you know, they, we would capture anything from these other projects. We would have to pay these notes off first. 
So um, in the event that there are no other projects, then essentially this money just gets wiped out at the end of, uh, at the end of the TIF period, at the end of the 23 years, which is I think 2035 or something. But, um, but it, it definitely acts as a significant overhang um, on the entire TIF area. Um, and and it, it's, it's a concern. And that's what happens if you only get phase one, uh, if only phase one happens. Um, and I don't know if it's worth um, mentioning the context of 2017, but um, in 2017, uh, in the February meeting uh, here in HUDS, I uh, testified about this project. And um, I, if you guys care to look, it's at around the two hour and 42 minute mark of that video. Uh, is where I, I presented, um, and I said at the time that this project uh, represents uh, a bet on the part of the city that phase two is going to happen. No. Uh, the numbers that we presented at the time just showed if both phase one and phase two happens. That's essentially what you see in the phase one and two existing numbers on the third line of that cover page. Um, obviously, there's fewer years now uh, remaining um, so the, the even phase one and two will generate a little bit less than the eight million that they're asking for. So you're still going to have to dip into the area wide a little bit. Back in 2017, that was not the case. Um, or alternatively, to dipping into the area wide, you'd have to dip into the bottom half of the eats. Um, but it's, I wanted to give you that context. Um, uh, so it's not to say that this is somehow suddenly different. Uh, I will say that my, um, I did find an error in my 2017 numbers where I overestimated the amount of EATS that would be generated um, by a little bit, not by a significant amount, but by a little bit. Um, so there was a little bit of uh, reduction for that, but. Um, um. Okay, so it, it, I think assuming we can kind of get through some of the legal obstacles that were raised by our city councilor, and the issue, as I understand it, is is if we did it under the existing format, your feeling is is, is that it would basically the, the project, if phase one happened and phase two did not happen, it would suck out basically all the growth of revenue from the whole TIF district into that project, and we would not be able to do anything else. Is that kind of your position? Well, not that we couldn't do it. It, just, it would just it would impact other things that we could do. And so, uh, you know, we would like to see phase two come along and uh, uh, obviously su uh, support the overall uh, and, and vision. And you're, you would like to support the project. Yeah, but and with, so. With less dependent on the area wide TIF uh, revenues, but in exchange, you are willing to either lengthen or create a new TIF, which would create a longer, period. Uh, a longer period to collect the revenue from the project all alternatively and we have not done i mean we have are there other projects that we've offered the bottom half of the tip tiff notes to uh and the first uh soccer uh rendition uh that we did we did okay so but but your other thought would be that you would be potentially open to offering yeah, so so essentially what i'm saying is that we would the board of aldermen could approve uh, an eight million dollars uh, obligation to this project contingent upon the second phase actually getting uh, uh, funded and uh, immediately upon uh, f f uh, clarification or verification of funding you could then authorize the, 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 that second phase to get started right away that the the, uh, the first phase could get started, I mean, if it's one and a half or whatever that number is that we say is generated for that first one. I mean, provide that. And how, okay, so that's, that's, that's the city's, or SLDC's position. Is, uh, let me kind of go through and then we'd like to go up and provide the developer an opportunity to respond. Alderman Boyd, do you, uh, have any questions about what you think this current situation is or what the issues are here? I have a lot of questions, but I'm not sure if I should just wait until after the developer speaks. Okay. Uh, but there is one question I could ask no matter what. Uh, I'm just kind of curious, Otis. Um, so the redevelopment agreement was um, 
canceled what, a couple years ago? Uh, it was in 2018, I believe. And, and it, it, from my standpoint, it seemed to be arbitrary. I understand I hear you saying, well, nothing was happening, so you just took the development rights away. But certainly, a project that have been seemed like 20 years in the making. I know. I think it started in what 2005 or something like that. I'm talking about the whole North Generation. Early thing. 2000s. Yeah. Um, there's been legal, you know, gymnastics. There's been a whole lot of complications. Um, I'm surprised that the developers are still in business with so many lawsuits and all this. But certainly, developers have been persistent and saying, "I want to do this." I want to make this right. I want to reinvest in this challenging neighborhood. And I'm perplexed as to why we would terminate a redevelopment agreement unless there's a developer in the waiting. So is there a developer in the waiting that we want to? That, that was the that, accusation at the time that we did it. As none has appeared to, to this date. We're over a year and a half right. later. So, so my no, point I, I is take it offense seems to that arbitrary. idea that, that we did it. We did it because at the time we were in other litigation and we found that uh, th there were issues at hand. So I'm not going to speak to those. Right. Uh, so we, we basically moved in that direction because of it. Yeah, and I'm not being contentious. Okay. You know, I'm just saying what the perception is because it, 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 if you have somebody out there that spend all this money, I mean, well, you, uh, you got to know something uh, is going on. If, if you could, you know, we work with lots of developers, right. and they and they generally uh, provide redevelopment. In this case, we've been at it for a long time, and we don't have any redevelopment. Right. Okay. And yeah, we've had developers that have several tips on the books and didn't do anything. And we terminated them. Yeah. Okay. But they, we, but we, we have kept, but we, we kept have 143 tips. We terminated 43. Okay. Of them. Now, if you want to maybe, you know, I can go there with you. I know right? that because I we go to pyramid saying, construction, I'm just saying, and I asked you guys not to give those. I was against those tips. I said he has too many on the books. He's not doing this. He was going to do the, the center downtown. That's and then you end up terminating them. Um, so it depends on we pick and choose, and it depends on who the administration is. You pick and choose who you want to work with, and um, how you want to work with them. So. I, so let me ask you this. Sure. You terminate the redevelopment agreement, can you just reenact the redevelopment agreement? I think what, what uh, we said is that we need to restate the redevelopment agreement. Okay. You need to restate it. Okay. I'll, I'll save my other questions for later. Okay. Thank you. Uh, and all of them just, uh, we live in a political world. I don't, maybe this is my comments. I think perhaps part of the reason why the the development agreement was terminated with some publicity about some sort of some transaction with some buildings that but I shouldn't I, well, I shouldn't even go there uh, and I don't uh, Alderman uh, Kodar I guess I want to just step back and ask I, a, a, a more I, global question I, so if the redevelopment agreement for the north side TIFs has been terminated that's subject to litigation right now, isn't it? Yes. And that's not, yeah. where is, is that pending in the city, I assume? Uh, I will let, maybe, someone can speak to that for me. Where, where are we? Where Where's the law, what, what court are we in for the lawsuit? And, yeah, so, so essentially the, re, the lawsuits are with actually the Bank of Washington. Okay. And not with the redeveloper. Okay. Um, and, so right now, if the, the if the TIF, if the district-wide TIFs collecting any eats, where are they just going into? A, are they still going into a, a special allocation fund? Going into a special allocation fund. Okay. And I'm sorry. What is the is the balance? Did I hear the balance of the special allocation funds? About eight hundred sixty-two. Yeah, about eight hundred sixty thousand. All right. Um, and do we have sort of, I guess projections so saying we if we didn't do this prod or if if we did nothing if this project doesn't happen you know two years from now do we have an idea of what the balance of the special allocation fund would be do we have projections on that well um so since 2013 uh this project i mean this uh special allocation fund has collected a little less than three million okay. so in six years it uh, collected three million
Okay. Um, I'll reserve my questions till I've heard from uh, representatives of the developer, but I mean, I, I can say that I'm a little bit skeptical of how this will work if we're being asked to pass a project that's relying on a redevelopment agreement that the city has said has been canceled and that's currently subject to litigation. I don't know how we're supposed to make this decision while that's in flux, but I will listen and uh, reserve any further questions till after we've heard from the developer. Um, Owen Oldenburg. And, and this, these may be questions for after um, the, the development um, side gets it, but the, the proposed bill the, the, that, that currently are, you're, you're discussing, all the women, <clears throat> what does what does adding the additional co-developers actually achieve from a technical standpoint? I would like to have someone okay, come up and speak to that. So I'm maybe sure I'll just, just reserve my questions for after yeah, the developer explains those. Funded, I don't know, yeah. They can, they'll speak to that. Okay. Yeah. So my questions, Chairman, really revolve around that the, the composition of those ownership groups and what's actually effectuated as a result of this amended and restated um, proposal. So I'll I'll yield and wait. Thank you. Alderman Boyd, do you have any questions? The only question that uh, is probably more than one question. One question I have: How is it uh, a older person from the fifth? They're just now seeing this. That's my first question. And then the second question is: Is the city's focus on rebuilding a community a community to help? the people that's down there to get medical care or is it another agenda that I'm missing? Uh, all the women, I think I'll answer your first one, I mean your last one first. Uh, we are in support of uh, doing this project. The only thing that we've questioned is the uh, financials on the project. Okay, so that is the only thing that we're questioning. We're not saying do not do the project. Uh, and your first question was the, she never saw this, okay. so why is it right. that they, so you, this, the, the, she came in blind? The summary sheet is something she did not, has not seen. Uh, the, the first two pages of that is the same, or essentially the, the, is the document that was provided to the board when the TIF was first, when it was first approved. So I'm just bringing that back up. Uh, the thing that we have not had is very good communications uh, between the parties, and we'll admit that. But uh, so from my perspective, uh, the only conversations I've had about this project has been just recently through a, a series of uh, emails with Mr. Piggy. Until that point, I wasn't aware that it was actually moving ahead. And so I guess I'm on the outside looking in. I see a community that has a, a, a huge need for these services. And so I guess from the city councilor and from the city itself, it's nothing you all can do to try to work to start phase one. I, I just outlined how we can do it. That, okay. that was my, my viewpoint. Uh, we can start phase one and then we can provide, uh, the developer can provide uh, the documents to show that, he can, that he's planning to build phase two. This, this doesn't work with just phase one. It does not, for the amount of money they're asking. Okay, so they're, they're asking for over, uh, all total with phase one and phase two, about $8 million. So the first phase, uh, I think they're asking now for us to activate a little over $6 million. And so the first phase, the, the building itself, the three-bed hospital, uh, is about $1.5 or $6 million is what it needs from TIF to be able to be constructed, the way I understand their previous uh, assumptions. The remainder of that was to be to provide roads that would go out into Pruitt Igo and to provide a route from Cass Avenue over to this. I, you know, what I'm saying is, is that if you're short on funds, is that needed at this point until you're able to show that you can do the second phase? If you can do the second phase, if you have money to do the second phase, then the city could then allocate the monies associated with that. I think that would be prudent. Otherwise, the city will be out of, the, of that money. And so we, we talk about where we are as far as r with rating agencies and others, that to, to pass it and approve it without having some certainty that you're going to be able to collect 
would not be what I would call uh, financially uh, prudent. Okay, thank you. Okay, I think we've gone through the whole committee, and I think Mr. I. Mr. President. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. President. Forgive me. I, uh, I would. <laughs> That's all right. Chomping at the bit. Thank That's why you. I look over. Thank you, <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, actually, I'm going to reserve most of my questioning for the all the woman from the fifth, uh, because I'd like to hear from the all the woman in the fifth. Um, you know, when you come back, um, you know, how you view uh, the TIF impact financial impact study for phase one and phase two. And the, it's my understanding that the use of these TIF funds are for mainly infrastructure improvements, right, roads and things of that nature. Um, and uh, you're going to be building a, an emergency room hospital. So uh, how important is it that those roads be built out so that, they're, so that you know, truly the ambulances and everything can get access to it and stuff? So, so um, I'd like to hear some of those things when you, when you Come back. All right, thanks. Oh, sorry. So do we have, uh, I think when we did this originally, didn't we have like a site plan and some, do we have that? I'm, I'm pretty sure uh, we do have that. Have that. I'm not sure we have. Well, I have something, but this is, this is probably not. Do, do we still have the site? I thought they had like a site plan and then they kind of had an overview of the project and everything. We didn't bring, we didn't bring that, but I, I do have something if, if some people just want to uh, take a look at it. But at this time, I would like to bring up uh, some representatives uh, from the developer so that they can speak to some of the uh, sure. comments. And I think most specifically what we definitely need to teach touch on is uh, the importance of the certificate of need because there are some legal parameters that you have to address prior to moving some of these things along too. At least enough for the people here. Yeah. Uh, good morning, Mr. Chairman. It's still morning. Um, uh, thank you for um, considering this. Uh, this bill this morning. Um, I've got a, a, a large group of people who can answer a lot of technical questions, um, but I, I, there's some things that I want to address that were brought up in the uh, previous testimony that I think can help us frame where we are and how to analyze and look at what we're doing. Um, you know, first of all, um, you know, I, um, you know I, I guess, you know, as, being a lawyer, I'm kind of not used to people bringing evidence to the hearing that nobody the other, ha other side hasn't seen. So I really can't comment on, uh, on, on some of the specifics because we haven't had a chance to analyze it. I will say that um, I don't know what priority could be higher for a, a, a TIF fund than, uh, than a hospital in an area that is a, that's, that's a health desert. Um, and I also want um, to, two, two other things I want to start off with, uh, the idea that um, M1, which is the first phase, is separate than the second phase. That's never been the case from the very beginning in, uh, in, in 2016 and 2017 when this bill was passed. No one ever considered doing this project with just the um, uh, three-bed emergency room. That was never a consideration. Uh, actually, the certificate of need, which gives us the uh, legal right to start a hospital, requires that we start with the three-bed emergency room hospital. Actually, one year after that hospital opens, we can, order, we can then, without having to go back to the state, immediately start building phase two. Uh, understand that the investors, and we have someone here can speak to that if necessary, uh, the investors never considered uh, doing phase one without phase two. That's never been a consideration. Um, if you look at the uh, rating from SLDC previously and today, um, I think um, in our latest rating we got five out of five because it is considering phase one and phase two together. So the idea that it can be separate is simple, isn't true. That's not how anybody ever approached this project, and it's kind of unfair to make that the discussion because that's really not a discussion. No one ever even thought in terms of doing phase one without phase two. Um, a little background, um, and um, you know, I can remember um, in, in 2008, uh, Congress had a hearing in this very room, and um, 
just short, just in, to capsulize it, uh, in part of the testimony, I think it was uh, Congresswoman Waters asked um, Barb Geisman, who represented SLDC at the time, if there were any plans for North St. Louis and Pruitt Igo. This is in 2008. And you can look for yourself. She said, well, we have no plans for Pruitt Igo. Okay? So now let's fast forward to today. Uh, we got a developer. Uh, I will say, when I hear how we haven't had any success, I'm always uh, mystified why uh, NGA, the biggest federal project in St. Louis, is never included in the amounts, in the things that developers brought forward. So it's, um, I mean, with the, the jobs and the revenue that stays with the city from NGA, uh, you combine that with the uh, Greenleaf Grocery Store, which kind of um, helped uh, 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 solve a food desert problem. Here we are with the hospital and and people, I think Alderwoman Hubbard spoke very well about the uh, healthcare des desert. So um, I just wanted to, once, like again, it, uh, put things on, on, on focus on what we should be talking about. I also go back in time to years ago when I first came to the Board of Aldermen uh, back in the 70s, and I can remember uh, two old gentlemen who, when you walked in the Board of Aldermen, uh, I had a job with CDA when I was in college, and you walked into the Board of Aldermen, and the first people you saw were Red Villa and Ray Leisure. And um, I would bring messages from CDA for the Board of Aldermen. And as they, in between the time when they were eating on their cigars, um, they would talk to me about the, who makes the decisions in St. Louis. And they were uh, very explicit to me that it's the responsibility of the Board of Aldermen. That's who faces voters. Uh, when, when that's, who's in, that's who's in charge. So I respectfully um, disagree with some of the um, statements from SLDC. And I would hope the Board of Aldermen would um, maintain the control over the process and, and move forward with a bill that's previously passed uh, our changes are relatively uh, 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 negligible, except for a change in the, c the commencement and completion dates. The changes in the uh, development team is something that happened because, well, um, actually, uh, one of the reasons we're behind on this project is the city and their uh, zeal to take away the development rights has caused, um, uh, uh, they made some claims against the developer that the attorney general has rejected. That was the basis of uh, terminating the development agreement. That's turned out to be uh, a, uh, a reason that wasn't proven. So all these things add up to where we are today. And we're just asking to uh, go forward. Since the last bill was passed, we've spent literally hundreds of thousands of dollars to have the CON ex extended. Uh, we've got a building permit. Uh, we're ready to go with these minor changes. So. Um, uh, you know, SLDC hasn't had a great history in um, doing a lot of development in North St. Louis. Uh, here we have progress that's going on. I reiterate NGA, the grocery store, here's the hospital. You guys have not seen all of the plans that we have, but they're quite extensive. Uh, the idea that the, uh, um, uh, the uh, TIF won't be able to uh, support this project, we don't necessarily agree with those financial calculations, but even more importantly, uh, you know, I, I, I find it peculiar that we're on the defensive, okay? Here's a group of, here's uh, people trying to bring a hospital, and we're on defense, okay? We're on defense because what's at, what's, what's at issue is the developer is going to take on the responsibility of doing the infrastructure. In a city that's, that has the uh, 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 money, that would be the responsibility of the city. But the developer is taking on that task of... Um, of doing the infrastructure, and the issue is, uh, the city says, uh, well, uh, and I say the city, I mean SLDC, their contention is, uh, you can do the infrastructure, but we're against this project because we're not going to have enough money to pay you back. Okay? I mean, that's really what their argument is, that uh, the city won't have enough money to pay the develop back, developer back for the infrastructure. We don't agree with their financial calculations, but even so, the developer and the investors are poised and ready to go forward. So I would ask that um, um, uh, you consider that as you think where, sh where we should go today. With that, I, there, there are quite a number of things that I think you guys want to cover. Uh, I'll answer as best I can, but we have a team from the uh, development team that is very well versed in all the details of everything having to do with this project, and uh, 
and we're ready to go forward. If I could, I want to make sure I kind of understand your position. So your position is, is you, you came before a committee. Um, I was chairing it at the time, I recall. We passed a development agreement with you all that pledged revenue from the whole um, area-wide revenue from the TIF district. And that then... Um, uh, that w uh, and so that was that that was the project then and now what what exactly are you asking for today that's different you know how are you asking that to change then you said that with minor changes what are the changes well our changes is the um, um, uh, change of the commencement and completion date uh, other considerations of this bill and as needed, we can get into the legal uh, uh, ramifications of it. Um, uh, I, I don't know if the Board of Aldermen is the proper place to settle all these uh, legal questions. I will say, when it came time to take away the development rights or all the other legal issues that the city council is in today, they never came to the Board of Aldermen to ask. So I'm kind of perplexed why, if it's a legal argument, they would come to the Board of Aldermen and ask you and you're not in a position to analyze and make those decisions. So really, we don't have much change from 2017 other than a minor change in the, uh, uh, the, the, in the investors and the change in the completion date. And okay, the so you date. have a different, different ownership group. Small changes. Okay. And then can you kind of re refresh my memory on the size of the project and your, where the money's coming from and so forth so you have... Um, see, I, this has been so long since we dealt with all this, I can't remember any of it. Uh, I, I, I guess I have vague memories of, like, the, the project starting on the east side and entering it from Jefferson. Is, is the developer own all of the site at this point? And then are you all building roads through? Are we taking this TIF money to build roads through the site then? Or... I, uh, uh, Mark Vincent, who's okay. uh, an attorney who uh, can speak to some of the sub uh, specific issues on the finance, but I will say that certainly the, uh, the benefit of the roads will be much wider than the, just the hospital. Um, you know, I'm, I'm amused when we talk about the uh, infrastructure and, uh, it, it, and, and we, we act like it's only going to be used for the hospital, but the street, it'll, it'll, it's a responsibility of the city, but we'll take that on. But as far as your questions as to the uh, financial structure, I'm familiar with it, but Mr. Vincent being here, I would defer to him. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak here to you all today. Uh, do, just to catch up right where we were, the financing packet of this whole, this project, the phase one, is three parts. I'm, uh, it's been asked if you could identify. My name is Mark Vincent. And, and your employer? Or, or I, I am a self-employed attorney, but I'm also an investor in the project. Oh. Okay. And the reason why I was brought aboard, uh, there's been just a few four-bed hospitals, three-bed hospitals done in the, in the state of Missouri. I think there's four of them. I've done two of them. And that's why when I was, I was brought on, because I've done this stuff before, uh, I do a, my set's a little bit different than most people's, but most lawyers, I'm not here as an attorney. That's why we got Daryl and his staff, but I can have the financing and the operation of the hospital and how it works. The financing of it is three parts. There's a senior debt and, the, I'm sorry, there's equities, the main one. Then there's senior debt, which is our bank loans. There's a TIF, and there's new market tax credits. We have a commitment on the equity. We have commitments from banks. Can you, how much equity are you talking about? About $10 million. Okay. And is that for phase one or phase, both phases? That's phase one. Well, everything I'm saying now is phase one. We okay. have $10 million of equity. We have loans of about $12 million, I'm sorry, $8 million of loans that we've already have commitment for, and then we have the TIF. And all total, that comes to 22, a little bit over $22 million. Is and what the, the cost of project. what, about six point? Six million, but actually four of it would be for this project is what we're looking at, it's what's what, that's what we're at, uh, figuring in. Is, yeah. is how much did you say? 4.6 million, I think is what, 
for move. this project, yeah. and then the sixth number is for both project uh, for both phases. Right, just two million dollars to help with some of the infrastructure there. That, but so if you look at it all, the the uh, new market tax credit is kind of like a combination of equity and debt. We have an investor who is putting in hard cash of four million dollars. We we have. Uh, investors that are putting in obligations that they have that total up six million dollars and then we have eight million dollars of loans and we have about three million dollars the four million dollars of the TIF that comes into this project to reach the 22 million dollars um, the commitments from the banks are there they're solid I arranged those those are done the well, only thing we're waiting on right now is approval from the, for the TIF. As soon as the TIF had said we're, go, we're good, those guys are ready to close. The new market tax credits will follow the TIF. We've been working with a national firm for years on the new market tax credits. We have the allocations. We have identified the buyers of the allocations. They just, they, once we all have to see the TIF, but the, the total of it, it's 22 million and a little bit north of that. Um, and that's for phase one. Phase one. So um, something that Daryl misspoke just a little bit uh, is with the three bed hospital, as soon as it's certified by CMS, if we wanted to, we have every right to start the second phase right then. We don't have to wait a year to start building. We can start building the day after certification. You can't open until a year after certification. So if this is our plan, it's not to wait the full year after the certification of, of those by CMS of the first phase. It's to start building soon thereafter. So try to trying to say that we don't need the additional money if somebody doesn't understand how the plan works and what the what the expansion and how it's going to grow. So anyway, we've talked met several times with the fire people, the fire department, they're very much interested in this project and how the, the emergency facilities that it'll, it'll provide and the access off of, I think CAS is critical because of that. Um, but anyway, I'm not in here as an engineer or a lawyer, I'm here as a the banker and a businessman, if I can answer any questions so, on that. So the $6 million that that you don't need this the last couple million of that until you do phase two is that correct probably so but I, you know that that's kind of what we're if you look at the models I'm not going to sit here and tell you it's something that's not in the models I've you know, I've worked enough with Mark Grimm Mark Grimm knows that he and I've worked together on millions of dollars worth of projects I'm not going to sit here and say something that's not correct we've solved a lot of problems haven't we yeah, Mark I, I uh, guess my my concern is is somebody working for the city and I, right. again it would help if we had a site plan and say I think it would all of this stuff we would, I think they'll be presenting us, one. like a sources and uses and a phasing if we had all that stuff before us I think it would really help but what what I would be concerned about is 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 that we go ahead and create a TIF. You all build out an infrastructure through your hundred acres, and uh, the second phase never gets built, and we've just right. made your property far more valuable. There's and only 34 acres there, sir. How much? 34 total. Thir okay. Total what I goes 34 acres. The Health Works Village is the south 17. Right, Bill. You got the chart. I'm going to let them go with it. They have the charts and the diagrams. And, and do, you, do we have like a written sources and uses of the phases and all that stuff? Or? Uh, it should be. I guess there, this is on the back of the packet here is probably the sources. Oh, that the That's the original plan? one. And they, they really haven't changed much, is that? Much they haven't. Well, this shows $2 million in equity. Didn't you say there's $10 million in equity? I think so. Uh, $10, $10 million in equity. Part of that is the version of the new market tax credit from Alex. Come on, come on. Okay, sorry. The, 
new cash being brought into the, the, pro, to the program is $4 million, just cold, hard dollars. There's the obligations that people are incurring, all the personal obligations on the new market tax credits and, and the, other op, uh, the other debts. They are borrowing money that they're responsible for, that they're taking and putting that into this project as equity, the total of $6 million. That makes the $10 million in equity. The project is not responsible for repaying that, that six, the second six million dollars I'm talking about. Okay, the, we have no obligation to repay that. The company, the hospital, the property company, none of them have that obligation or responsibility. It's just a way of coming up with equity. It's like if you went out and borrowed money and took that money that you borrowed and invested it in another company. That's right. all we're doing. And who's Who's, uh, whose new market tax credit allocation are you using? We have a couple of them. Okay. Uh, are you going to tell us where they're coming from? Okay. I can tell you, uh, well, all right. I would, you got to. Well, no, Alderman, um, uh, unfortunately, uh, there are people behind uh, the curtain who uh, are trying to undo what we're doing. So we're kind of circumspect um, about. Uh, 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 being public with uh, who exactly is um, uh, who, who's going to fill that role because there unfortunately there are those who kind of represent the city that kind of go behind and try to undo what we do okay so we're kind of circumspect about that not out of disrespect or anything and I'm, and I'm sure off offline we could we could uh, 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 discuss that but that's a hesitancy because we've actually seen representatives from the city try to undo what we do, we're doing behind the scenes. So I, I think, but uh, you can rest assured that uh, the effort that we're putting forth uh, would not be there if we didn't have uh, the financial stack in place. Understood. So you're going to go through. You're going through the first phase with your equity stack and then the, I guess this this one here is for the combined phases that's on the back of the board bill which I can't read but we have not presented anything about the, the second phase well it was uh, this is previously presented information that's attached to the board bill <coughs> but Alderman, I, I will say that the um, uh, uh, SLDC early in this process we met with the mayor in order to move forward with the analysis from SLDC and uh, at, at and um, we can send you the analysis that that was done by Mr. Ferry but uh, I can show you uh, Lynn we can I, I can I can show you the the most important part of that long document that shows the benefits to the city and it shows the rating of five out of five and I guess my point is that okay you have it yes. but, but so Daryl you guys have not Mr. Ferry's new modeling this is the first year, I think you said earlier, this is the first you're seeing this is today. Exactly, okay. which is a bit unfair yeah, uh, no, to, I to, I to try to, de you know, to, for someone to try to pull the rug from under us at, uh, at, at the hearing that we have, don't have a, a proper opportunity to respond, it would be, uh, would be wrong. Yeah. So, well, we, I don't know what your time requirements are, but if we need to, we, you know, we could always schedule another hearing and everything. To, you know, our goal is, is to try to get everybody on the same page. My goal is to try to get everybody on the same page and a good outcome. Or, or do you need all six million then for the first phase, or are you willing to have some sort of? Is there some flexibility where you can go ahead and pull down some more after you, you know, to do the second phase? Or, well, Alderman, um, I, th I think um, uh, our preference by far would be to go forward as as presented. Um, you're asking us to uh, defer to uh, those who really haven't shown the uh, uh, consideration to the project that we think is proper. So uh, we would hope they'll we'll be able to go forward. Uh, and and uh, to, to answer that question, I, don't, uh, I would say the answer is no, we need to go forward as is because um, uh, and, and, and it, as is, that, is that your site plan there? Site plan. Yeah. Why don't you show that? And then I, I think I'm going to have my question. I'll have some more comments at the end. But uh, so can you walk us through? Yeah. Uh, William Laskowski with M Properties. So these are some of the documents that we presented last time around a couple of years back. And uh, 
Chairman, the, uh, the, the key document doesn't really show up well here, but if you guys can envision this TIF was made on the western one-third of Pruitt-Igo. And the answer to your question is after meeting with Chief Jenkerson, after meeting with MoDOT, after meeting with MSD, after meeting with Ameren, all of the infrastructure that it takes to do one little corner here is not as simple as limiting it to that three acre. Similar to what NGA just went through where the city uh, took TIF and, and Brownfield to en masse uh, grade and remove all of those things. We've got the same issues on Pruitt Igo almost times three. Mm -hmm. So in order for there to be access from CAS, two means of access for the chief to bring his ambulances and buses, we, we sized all of these roads, we sized the parking lot, and according to Chief Jenkinson, the size of his buses and ambulances. That needs to happen. We need to have another means of power from a different direction. This was all explained before in the previous time, so there's no change whatsoever. To do the original first phase hospital, we need to have some uh, expansion in and around it to accomplish these infrastructure things. Could you do like PDAs or something where we activate PDA one? now uh and where would the second phase be so that we could actually have like two tranches of your so you could do four million and then when you get phase one done you come back and do the second, well, the second th th there's a minimum required to, to have the first project work is the answer to the question and so it's it's the well, I, I thought we just heard it was four million was it not uh, 4.6 something yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, I'm, uh, and then, and then there's an infrastructure tip, there's an M1 tip, there's an M2 tip. Um, Is there, how much of your, how much do you feel in your mind do you need area-wide TIF resources to go ahead and support the project? Um, well, you know, that was, as we move forward from 2017, that was the uh, expectation of the people who were involved. Mm -hmm. Well, that's an expectation. All the financing people that uh, Mark just talked about, that that's going to be in place. Those are important things to have in hand. Mm -hmm. So, and that's part of the answer to your question there, too. And, and I would say, as if we dismantle what we have in place for phase one and phase two, and it'll be our job to go and get the finance for phase two, well, that's quite an extra hurdle that's put in front of us. When we've been working for the last two years with a certain expectation, uh, we've moved forward, like I said, we We'll be ready to go, and now to go back to investors with a different, uh, uh, with, 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 a, with a material change would be, go for it. Uh, would be quite honest. I, I'm going to have some more questions, but I don't want to uh, tie this all up. we got other committee members here, um, but um, can you just show me where, one last thing, phase one, where is phase one and where is the infrastructure that we're all, that, that you're wanting to build out? Do you have the, like the site plan of the 30 acres? So is this going to take all 30 acres? So some of the original data you all okay. have from the original TIF, so that, that bottom part shows the western one-third of Pruitt Igo. That was the limits of the TIF area. Those are the areas in and around grading, remediation, new, new sewers, roads, infrastructure. That really just shows the site plan per se of the hospital, uh, so it's not indicative of the whole land area that we need. So if, if picture in your mind, 34.6 acres of Pruitt Igo, then it's roughly a third of that 12 acres is what this new TIF pertains to and why it, it, it's very similar to the NGA project where all of that stuff had to be in Moss to even get going to have the to have a complete project. And by the way, I mean, you're looking at one of the people who put in the application back in 2012 on that project. To, to, to stand there and say that non-performance on our part, like we're twiddling our thumbs way back when, we worked hard from 2012, 13, and 14 to land that job and then arranged the team with the city, brought the city in, developed the team to win that. I, I, I was flabbergasted to hear that we've done nothing here. We've done nothing but try to work this, this area to try to produce a new skyline, a new horizon, and to get something moving here. Thank you, Mr. Laskowski. Uh, Mr. Boyd, Alderman Boyd, any questions? What's that? I'm sorry. Uh, Laskowski. Mr. Laskowski. Laskowski. I'm sorry, I had to step out. What's your role in this? Um, I'm uh, with M Properties, and so I'm the Chief Development Officer of M Properties. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, Mr. Piggy, yes, is the city guaranteeing this, Jeff? 
Well, I think if you fall short, the city got to really obligate to pay any money out? Um, no. I think if it came up short, the developer would have to hold a bag for paying for the infrastructure if it wasn't paid back, which is something that they've cons we've considered and are willing to go forward. And so the clock has already started running on the TIF, right? Certainly. So how many years we have left on it? I think the number is maybe 13. 13. And y your development team feel real confident that in 13 years you can pay this off? Yes. Okay. And who gets to make that decision only if you're financially solvent to be able to do that? Well, I don't know if it's a question if we're financially solvent. I mean, maybe solvent is not the right word, but financially capable of pulling this off in 13 years. Who, whose decision is that to make? Um, well, I think um, through the um, financial analysis that's taken place already and the fact that phase one and phase two together get five out of five, I think that's uh, all parties involved agree that phase one and phase two are financially viable. Okay. The question is if we try to separate phase one, which we've never tried to do and is not the proper way that we would want to go forward. So okay, let me ask you this way. So, so is it the city's responsibility to say you're fin if it's financially feasible for you or is it you as the development team uh, obligation to say if you're financially feasible, if it's financially feasible? Whose decision is it? Well, I think, I mean, ultimately it's the city's. It's the city's? Yeah, certainly. Okay. I mean, we, um, if not, we, we probably wouldn't be here. We, we'd be gone. We'd be already doing it. So <laughs> certainly it's the city has the, is the final decision maker on the uh, viability of the TIF as part of the, uh, the uh, uh, stack of finance. For this but project. you have to demonstrate to the city that you uh, can financially pull this off, right? And I think that's been done. Okay. Without doubt. It's you been you done think already. without a doubt. Okay. It's been done. It's why we got five out of five. But okay. the question comes up if we try to separate M1 from M2, but that's not a proper analysis. Right. And so what I heard your investors say that basically after you build phase one and get certified, you're going to go ro right into building phase two. Is that correct? Alderman, without doubt, okay. if we could start building the large hospital the first day, we would. But the process through the CON is we have to start small. Right. But without doubt, the goal and, and, and I mean, it's not on the table right now, but there are a lot of plans for that this three-bed hospital mm -hmm. kicks off, uh, um, I mean, uh, it, it kicks off quite a few different uh, medically related developments at that site, including a medical school. Uh, uh, um, and I mean, I don't think it's a secret anymore that, uh, you know, the, the hospital is going to be named Homer G. Phillips Hospital, okay? And I think that's significant because you can't ignore what the financial impact of this hospital is going to be in this neighborhood. Mm -hmm. You can compare what it did to the Ville. If you've been in the Ville lately, you know that uh, after 1979, it started a great decay. And the biggest uh, uh, start of that decay was the removal of the hospital. So now we're trying to reverse that. And uh, the, the economic impact mm -hmm. of this project is much greater than trying to isolate the uh, uh, three-bed emergency room hospital as the, as a, as a, as the end because it is just the beginning, and, you, and it's not proper to evaluate this if you don't see the overall picture that we're trying to paint and what it's going to do for the uh, city and the, okay. and the neighborhood okay. around it. So let me have the developer, I mean the investor, come back up. Yes, sir. Um, so it's a $22 million project, phase one, right? Yes, sir. Oh, a little above. A little, a little bit over normal. And phase two is how much? We don't know yet, but because what we're trying to do right now is we've been requested by the fire department and we're working with a company out of Texas to put in a behavioral health facility mm -hmm. on, as part of that. And we're trying to get the firm commitment on how many beds would be a general hospital and how many beds would be devoted to behavioral health. But, uh, Bill, have you got that off? I answer that uh, based on the original tip which we put forward for and given to the city it's roughly valued at 52 million something like that 52 so million. that's the scale because you always have to be careful that the tip award can exceed a certain percentage of the total prof, um, project so both phases were in the 70 70 75 million dollar if that was remembering it now what mark's talking about is he's tweaking that he's making adjustments okay. and um how committed are you to phase two? Phase two? Mm-hmm. 100% committed. 100%. And you have, you will have 
money in that project as well. Personally invested, yes. Heck, yes, sir. <laughs> okay. All right, I have no further yeah. questions. Thank you. Um, Alderman Kotar. Thanks. I think I'm going to back up and just ask very generally. I, I know phase one's a three bed ER and I guess urgent care. What, what all is phase two entail? Can somebody, maybe we covered that earlier and I just missed it. We were looking at a hundred, we, when, before we discovered how much, how critical behavior health was, we were looking at the second phase being exclusively a general hospital where we had, you know, like probably a hundred bed hospital. We've got to find, we found out, and this is after a lot of study, that the, one of the biggest needs in St. Louis and the surrounding area is mental health. So what we're probably we're looking at now is taking that 100 beds and allocating them on a three-story three building. So the phase two would be part general hospital with the top floor being behavioral health. And that's what we're looking at right now. So somewhere around 70-30. And then as that 70, fills, 30 general, the behavior, yes, 70 sir. general, 30 yes, behavioral, sir. 70 general, 30 behavioral. And as that fills up, we would go to th the third phase, which would be a general, just, I'm sorry, we would convert the third floor of, of the, that was being used as behavioral health back to general hospital and build a behavioral health hospital. Okay. And uh, who's managing i mean assuming this all gets built and everything who's actually you know providing the care who's managing the hospital oh, managing the hospital sitting right back there his name is fred mills he's a former ceo of missouri baptist here in st louis okay he's the brains behind the operation of the hospital and sir you mentioned you've had some you've done some other um small i guess two three bed Yes, sir. Uh, hospitals. Where, where, where are those? They're in Missouri, you said? Yeah, the one here and Patients First Healthcare in Washington, Missouri. Patients First? Patients First. That was the one that went to the Supreme Court. And uh, as soon as we, as soon as Patients First beat Mercy, Mercy bought out Patients First. Okay. And what's the other one? Uh, there's two other ones down in Southern Missouri, and I was not involved in those. I was involved in two out of four. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Nothing further from now, Chairman. Um... Alderman Oldenburg. Sure. I'm still having trouble validating the flow and, and the financing. I mean, it's been represented that, that you have the balance of financing, but I think when one asked from the Alderman from the 7th on some of those salient details, uh, it's, we'd rather not say. I know, Mr. Chairman, it's, you know, it's always been my um, obligation down here to really scrub where the balance of money is coming from, particularly when public subsidy is being requested that we have evidence of wherewithal, that we have evidence and or commitment letters in hand from lenders um, and any other federal and or local state subsidies and programs that may be there. So I, I, think, it's, I think this is a, a worthy project, worthy of, of our best efforts in trying to figure out that the capital stack balances from a sources and uses perspective. But there's, I feel like there's a limited amount of information for me to make a decision with where's the senior loan coming from? Do you have commitments from community development entities? And what amount of allocation is that? At what pricing? Is there an investor letter of intent? Those are all salient details that I think is worthy, particularly given the swirl of controversy around this particular develop larger development and TIF and agreement that we have those because I want to find a way to bring this infrastructure investment to this to this particular borrower. So those are questions and or information that I would love to see before I can render a decision in, in putting this project first. I'll tell you right now, Daryl said I could do it. So okay. I'm not the lawyer in this gig. So uh, sure. um, start with the loans. Yep. You said an $8 million senior loan. Total eight million. There's three different entities involved. Okay. United Bank of Unions, three million. Yep. Harbors Local, they, the uh, the council, the St. Louis Kansas City District Council of Carpenters. Okay. Yep. Uh huh. At three million. Okay. Sterling Bank, located in Clayton. Yep. 
Um, actually, they're out of Poplar Bluff, two million. So there's your, there's your $8 million loans. Okay. New market tax credits. The allocations come from Central Bank of Kansas City. Okay. And uh, Baker Tilly, one of the big new market tax credit firms. Did you agree with that, Mark? Yeah. Uh, uh, in the United States, has their own fund. And they're putting up the rest. Okay. So Baker between Tilly. between Central Bank of Kansas City and one of Baker Tilly's affiliate CDs, you're coming to a $20 million or a $22 million allocation? $22 million allocation. $22 million allocation. Okay. And then there's the investor's equity. So that's it. Right, but so that's the allocation. Do you have an investor the, or someone who's monetizing the credits from? Yes, we, okay. do. we have a central bank who's also going to buy them. Oh, okay. Yeah. Good. So we have all that's in place. <coughs> so as soon as you guys say go, we can close in 60 days. Got it. So part of your $10 million equity number actually was a net net number of $6 million from the new market tax That's credit correct. equity, yes, which, which is technically characterized as debt, but in a low interest loan product that then is forgiven. That's correct. Okay. Yeah. You yep. got, you've got to exact. Trying to explain that is hard, so you, you, you have it exactly. I've correct. taken an interest in tax credits actually okay. lately. <laughs> so. Exactly. Okay. Well, that, that's helpful. Um, so there's a consortium of banks that are getting into your $8 million, so you're effectively going to try to get somewhere between 14 and 15 to leverage in to make sure you can realize that $6 million net benefit. Yes, sir. Excellent. Yeah. Okay. And we've got commitments. So. Okay. Um, I, would, I, would, I don't know if this is prudent, but I would love for those commitment letters if they could be shared with the committee or we re request that, the, that there be evidence of that. We have um, term sheets on those. Okay. Yeah, a anything. I didn't that, bring it with me today. I, don't, I understand. No, no, I mean, at, it, at, at any point in time, it'd be great to see those. And then I had maybe just some technical questions about the ownership. So it looks like two different, two additional co-developers are being effectively added to, to this. And, and why is that and what does that effectuate and how does that help you? Uh, Lynn Carey. Uh, uh, an attorney at Stone Layton and Gershman. Uh, we're representing the uh, developer and the development. Can you put a microphone on this a little bit? Oh, sure. Is that better? That's better. Yes. Okay. Uh, in regard to the uh, uh, adjustment relating to the additional co-developers, it does not really uh, represent any change per se in the ownership. It's the same, uh, essentially, part of the same overall ownership group. It is a technical adjustment actually based on our experience in the, with the Greenleaf TIF to uh, which we had to go back and amend the parcel development agreement to add co-developers. So as this stands, the co-developer, uh, or the single co-developer in the original agreement was uh, Northside Urgent Care Property, which is going to be the owner of the ground. And we are proposing in this a technical adjustment to add as additional co-developers the entity which is the qualified active low-income business uh, for the, that is going to be leasing the property from the owner for the new market tax yep. credit transaction. And the, uh, the last additional co-developer is HGP Hospital Corporation, which is an S corporation that is a member of the Qualic B and uh -huh. is being added solely for tax purposes. There's a structuring with the flow of funds to avoid income taxation on the TIF proceeds. So that would be the entity that would actually hold the TIF note and would provide the flow of funds into the project. So the, the additional co-developers are purely a technical adjustment. Right. So they, they, help, they, they help effectuate the financing, particularly exactly. around the new market tax credits. Um, so who will be the owners, though, of the NS Qualic B? If I could ask Mark, do you want to? It's 95% uh, Shamrock, I'm sorry, 95% North, North Side Urgent Care Property. Okay. And 5% the hospital. Understood. That's it. Okay. All right. Uh, Mr. Chairman, that's all I have for right now. Thank you, everyone. Um, Alderman Boyd. 
No, I'm learning. Uh, Mr. President? No question. Okay. Um, here's where I, I'm going to try to paraphrase, I think. Uh, or one last question. What is, excuse me. We have someone else that needs to speak as well. Okay, Mr. well, Chairman. one last question. We'll bring up your final speaker, and then we'll try to uh, figure. Phase one versus phase two. So you do phase one. You got your certificate need and everything. What other obstacles are there to stop you from getting the phase phase two done? Do you need to get a certificate of need? Is there, uh, do you need? The building permit, that would be the only so thing. Do we have financing now for phase two? Phase um, we don't have the sources and uses that, that, that we could present to you, Alderman, because we, we're trying to work on this part of the, uh, phase one first. Uh, that will flow as soon as we are, are, uh, get phase one uh, with, with the, the TIF to go forward. Um, but there are no administrative obstacles that uh, we face before doing phase two. Like I said, okay. I think it would be the building permit, which is pretty much okay. routine. That's okay. all we'd have. We'd okay. Be, we'd need. Uh, bring up your final speaker and then we'll kind of try to wrap this up for today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Joseph Dooley with uh, Stone Lake. I represent the uh, developer. And I just wanted to um, point out a couple of things. First off, there is no litigation currently pending between Northside and the city of St. Louis with regards to the master redevelopment agreement, okay? There is nothing in this amendment that deals with the master redevelopment agreement. This amendment that is before you is solely and exclusively limited to the parcel development agreement between HealthWorks and, the, and to amend that and the existing TIF ordinance that was passed back in 2017. There's nothing in this ordinance that relies upon the master redevelopment agreement. Nothing at all. The only relationship that there is is the fact that this project is asking and has been approved previously to receive funding from the overall TIF area. The majority of the property that funds this overall TIF area is in North St. Louis. This project is asking that those funds stay in North St. Louis and help develop this hospital. That's what this is about. Uh, the other thing that we'd like to point out is this uh, handout by SLDC. It's important to note that when this project is reviewed by SLDC, the same way it was back in 2017, that SLDC gives this project the same grade that it gave back in 2017, a five out of five. There is no difference in their grading on the project today versus what they did in 2017, and they've been provided the updated financial information. And to respond to Alderman uh, Oldenburg's concerns with regards to the, the documentation, that's already built in because just our, all we've done here in this ordinance or this amendment is we've, we've got to get you the financing by December 31st. You'll get all that. So the financing will be in place. There's one thing we know for sure, though. If you all do not approve this amendment, there will not be a hospital because that, the financing that you're talking about, the new market credits, those expire at the end of the year. They've got to be used, they've got to be done, and it's got to be done today so that the project can, go, uh, can move forward. Okay, let me uh, well, recognize um, Mr. Williams, our executive director, Ms. Way. I, yes, I thought I did. I'm sorry, Mr. Williams. Let me sign up. Uh, I'd like to just reiterate the fact that we said that we want this project to occur and that we had a, a path forward to how it could get done. And what I've heard is that we're, the financing for phase two is imminent. So I don't understand why what we suggested would not be a path forward which is that if you do phase one and if you think phase two is imminent and you have a source, you have your sources, which I, we have not seen. Uh, and so what we have been doing is based on what was presented to us two and a half years ago. And so it would be helpful too if the developer would provide or at least have conversations with the, with the development arm. We have not had those conversations. So let me, let, me, let me just say a couple of things. One, 
Uh, we have always indicated in every comment and every conversation we've ever had that we owe Mr. McKee a, a debt of gratitude for bringing the NGA opportunity to us. The idea of being able to get the project done was one where we had issues. Uh, and so, but we do appreciate the opportunity. So we do acknowledge the fact that that did occur. I do, I want to make sure that there was an allegation that the Attorney General exonerated Mr. McKee. I think that was a settlement. So I, I'm not sure if that's the same. I just want to make sure we're on record there. And I want to make sure too, I want to bring counsel up to talk about what we really need as far as documents. So it's not as clear as Mr. Dooley just ex explained. And so, uh, Mark. Hi, I'm Mark Grimm with Gilmore and Bell. Um, the parcel development agreement, so aside from the other issues that have been raised uh, from a legal standpoint, the parcel development agreement um, has a lot of references to the redevelopment agreement that has been terminated by the city. And so um, Mr. Piggy, uh, in Mr. Piggy's uh, letter to the chairman from September 24th, Mr. Piggy suggested and that the um, agreement be rewritten to eliminate the cross-references to a terminated, now terminated redevelopment agreement. We agree that with Mr. Piggy that that's a very good suggestion. Uh, and we strongly encourage uh, the committee to take Mr. Piggy up on his suggestion. Um, secondly, the TIF note ordinance that was previously approved and, and uh, pursuant to which the uh, parcel development agreement refers, um, uh, uh, we believe uh, it's problematic because it cross-references um, uh, 705.25, which is the ordinance that approved the prior parcel development agreement. And so as, as, um, aside from what you think about area-wide revenues or, or not, no area-wide revenues toward the project, from a legal standpoint, um, we think that uh, Mr. Piggy's correct. The, the parcel development agreement needs to be rewritten into a revised redevelopment agreement um, that doesn't reference a terminated redevelopment agreement and that there needs to be a TIF note ordinance. And I think if you uh, um, would ask the uh, Comptroller's Council, um, you don't have to take my word for it, you can ask uh, the Comptroller's uh, uh, Council uh, his opinion on, on the, uh, whether TIF notes could be is issued under that prior um, ordinance. Um, I guess the, my final point is that, um, you know, in the redevelopment agreement, if, if um, I mean, it seems pretty simple. If, if phase two is, is, is going to occur, um, that, you know, we could just include a provision that would provide for cancellation, authorize the notes in the full amount, and, and if phase two doesn't occur, uh, just provide for cancellation of, of part of the notes. Because um, you know, I think the point has been made, and, and no one has contested that if phases one and two happen, that it's a five-star project. And so it seems to me the simple answer is to um, just provide that part of the TIF notes are, are canceled if phase two doesn't occur. Thank you. Joe Dooley again. First off, the ordinance has written, and as a, the original ordinance has written was in phases. There was a phase one TIF, there was a phase two. Uh, the second TIF comes in phase two. So there's no need to, that has already been addressed. That's not going to be changed in the amendment. The second issue with regards to the allegation that there needs to be something written to change the amendment to strike any reference to the master development agreement, that's irrelevant because the ordinance does not include the entire redevelopment agreement as part of the ordinance. All it does is refer to individual sections and those individual sections still exist and those individual sections can still be referenced by incorporation. And it's our opinion that that does not invalidate the ordinance. It's our opinion that the only entity that can invalidate this ordinance is either the Board of Aldermen, which, of which you're a part, or a court, neither of which has happened. And we believe, and think it's also disingenuous for Mr. Williams to come up here now and say they want to talk to us when 10 weeks ago, when 10 weeks ago, we submitted proposals to them and they waited eight weeks to get a response to us. 
There was an eight-week delay yeah, I, I from think we submitted information to now. Here, here's what we'd like to do. I think the – I'm not an attorney, and I'm not in a position – I am currently not of the inclination to go ahead and vote until at least the folks working for the city are in agreement with it. I don't – I think somehow or another we ought to be able to talk about the legal stuff. I think the financial stuff, which I think I'm understanding, is – you know, is kind of a separate issue, and that probably should be the sticking point, but I think that there's, uh, there ought to be some flexibility in figuring this stuff out. From the city's perspective, if I understand SLDC's concern, is, is they're worried about going ahead and pledging area-wide revenue to a project that gets phase one built, and suddenly we'll be collecting revenue from this entire area 10 years from now to pay that off if that second phase doesn't get built. On the other hand, if the second phase gets built, we probably won't need the area-wide revenue. So somewhere in here, reasonable heads have to prevail. They offered several kind of interesting opportunities that I think are actually very generous. And I think, and, and I think that we ought to be able to figure out a way to either cap the amount of revenue uh, that is, uh, needs to be generated from the area wide, or we can go back and phase the pull down on the six point whatever million. Somewhere here, there ought to be an agreement where if people could just sit down and work this out and bring it back together before us, we're gonna be meeting next week and the week after that. So, and I, and I, and I Alderman Rohde, reasonable heads have done that. You did that in 2017. That's exactly what you guys did when you passed this ordinance in 2017. You looked at all this, this same concern. That same gentleman stood up in front of you and told you that this will not work on phase one alone, but, they were con but everyone was confident and hopeful they were going to take a leap of faith that phase two would come forward. You reasonable heads have already done all this, and that's why all we're asking for is, a, is, a, is a, an amendment of the dates to acknowledge the fact that it's been two years and it, we, need, we need in order to... We need well, all I know is, is right now I feel... Uh, I'm like whiplash. I hear one person say one thing, another person say something else. I'm not an attorney, and I can't distinguish, you know, whether or not the development need, agreement needs to be amended and restated or started from scratch. But I, I would think that, you know, there ought to be a willingness on SLDC's part to... That should be a small piece of this puzzle. I mean, if we, is that not? I mean, is that just the legal? I mean, somehow or another, we ought to be able to come up with. Uh, why, why wouldn't you want to just go ahead and do what? If, if, I'm sorry. If, if I may speak, Mr. Chairman, uh, with all due respect, uh, although you may have some faith in that process, um, me representing this community and someone who's been literally beat over the head since 2011, since I took the oath of office by simply being affiliated with Northside Regeneration. I just don't have that faith in the process with the city. I mean, just like he spoke to today, uh, we've been talking about this for months and there's been no communication. And I thank you for your leadership and at least making SLDC communicate because it, it was myself, uh, uh, Mayor Cruson, uh, Paul McKee, uh, people from the Carpenters Union, we all sat at a table and discussed this. We all know that in the past, uh, Mayor Cruson, she, as an older person, she voted in favor of this. Um, Conway voted in favor of this. And so there's been so many moving pieces to this puzzle. And there's been so many legal woes and so much back and forth regarding the whole process. And there's, um, there's some dis disingenuous stuff that has taken place. So I particularly don't have that faith in the process. I've seen us give away tips and incentives like candy around here, but we're not talking about a soccer stadium. We're talking about a hospital in the most underserved community in the entire state. And so it, it it's, I'm, I'm not a lawyer either, just like you said yourself, sir, but if the funding is going to disappear, if we don't go ahead and move on this, anytime you got people loaning hard cash 
upwards of four million, two million, that's very significant. And I just would hate for us to toy around with this on the backs of my constituents who desperately need health care. And Alder, Alder woman, I, I can't, you know, express my appreciation to you over the years for all the support you've done for projects. And, and there is absolute, I guess my, my word of caution and all this stuff, we can pass an ordinance down here, but we trying to get from A to B without cooperation from the comptroller's office when it comes time to issue the TIF notes and SLDC to work this through the process. And, and I, you know, I understand we, that, we, we'll Chairman. Up in a but if they mess. veto now, it, I would like for the public to see that veto take, ha that, take place. I would, I would like, like for to them give to this see it. a week and have your, your team digest this, uh, what we're talking about. And then I'd like, I, you know, it sounds like there's some sort of meeting on the minds, at least on the legal aspect of this stuff. So I'd like to try to give this a week. I don't know if one of our committee members would like to serve as a uh, mediator uh, and attend a meeting between SLDC, but we would be willing to appoint someone. W would you be willing to do that, Jack? Sure. Uh, the alderman from the 7th will sit in on the meeting, uh, given that he is the uh, sole attorney we have on the committee, and uh, he will be our gauge of who is being reasonable and unreasonable and uh, we will uh, defer to his judgment come next Friday, or next Wednesday, uh, if that's um, agreeable to everyone then. Alderman? Yes. Um, just a final statement. Um, you know, the Board of Aldermen has been put in a, a bad position here. They've mm -hmm. got arguments that we haven't heard before. They've got legal arguments. What I kind of see is they're putting you guys in the middle, okay, and they're trying to make you do the dirty work. Okay, they're trying to get you guys to kill this deal. If we don't go forward, man, people have spent hours and spent thousands and thousands of dollars. And to uh, keep putting us on their treadmill, um, that's part of their strategy. Well, I think next week we're going to be, one way or the other, we're going to be on or off the treadmill. Um, we can have a vote next week? Because, I mean, we... Now, I, hey, we I want you to go in there and bargain in good faith and not put us in the spot. So I'm not... Yeah, we'll bargain yeah, in good faith. We, we, we I am willing to pull it up for a vote next week, but I really want to have... Uh, uh, I really want to encourage that there be a meeting of the minds and that everybody shows up here singing Kubala next week. And thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I, I would just ask because, you know, we, we can't be naive in some of the backroom dealings that, ha that has taken place with development in my ward in the past. Uh, they stepped out there, I mean, shared information that some of their investors didn't want them to share. So I, I would hope that SLDC or whomever who've had access to this public testimony would not try to unravel this plan because what it's about for me is just gi giving my constituents access to health care. And so this, have, give, this gives them a week, but I hope that... Older woman, you have taken a great thank deal you. of grief for being the thank sponsor. You. And I, Mr. I would like to add Mr. one Mr. other thing, and I'll recognize you in just okay. a second, okay, Mr. Thanks. President. I just want to say... Um, there's been a lot said about Paul McKee. I think I've said this publicly. Um, you know, I, 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 I'm not firsthand knowledge of a lot of the things that went on up there, but, you know, uh, to his credit, he was able to get a, a tremendous amount of, of federal support. I think some of this uh, has been unfair on his part, and that, that uh, one of the biggest challenges of, of real estate development, particularly in an area, uh, you know, a depressed area, is site assemblage. And uh, it's very, very costly to assemble sites and then hold the land. And that lawsuit that slowed them down for a few years up there uh, created tremendous financial pressure, I'm sure, on them. And that, um, you know, really delayed the project, I think, and I'm sure it had an impact on his financial ability to, to do things. But I, I you know, I, I can't comment on some of the other things that have happened up there, but uh, that is a, that certainly was something that, it, at least in my mind, was a setback. So, um, uh, Mr. President. Yeah, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, at your discretion, I would like to also request that the alderman from the 22nd attend those meetings if he could. Uh, he's very knowledgeable on these types of development issues. He's knowledgeable about the area, you know, as the chairman of the caucus. He understands some of the many challenges that, um, that uh, you know, the other aldermen from North St. Louis face when trying to put forth developments. And he's dealt with us 
Excel DC on many, many of these very similar type issues. So I'd like to, you know. And he's my representative on the planet. He's your map representative. Well, yeah. So if accept he will this, accept. Uh, it's <laughs> responsibility, Alderman. Uh, 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 certainly I do, but I want to say this if you don't mind. Um, I am frustrated that we are put in a position to be judge on a jury trial. That's what I feel like we've been presented today. Lawyers on both sides. This is a project that's been in work for a long time. I cannot comprehend why SLDC has not made movement on this in some type of cooperative way before now. N no. <laughs> but what I do want, I, what, see, sometimes you have to put a fire on the people and you have to give them incentive to do what they need to do. And I would prefer to vote the bill out of committee and let them work it out and do a floor substitute. That way we know for sure they have an incentive to work on this bill, to get something done because it's hitting the floor. That would be my preference. Because I don't have the confidence that they're going to do what they really need to do. It's going to be a slugfest because that's what it seemed like it's been all this time. And it's a disservice to people in the African American community. So, you know, I, I'm going to make it, Mr. Chairman, you, you can accept it or not, but I like the move that we pass Board Bill 103 out of committee with a due pass recommendation. Second. Don't I what are our rules? Do I have to recognize that? Uh, Alderman, I'm going to vote against that today. Next week, you might get my vote, but if you want to go ahead and proceed with this, then we... I'd like to take okay. a vote. All right. Why they look oh, open? Gosh, can I, I ask a question? For, if, if we vote and it doesn't pass, can you still come back? You can say, okay. Madam Clerk, call the roll. Alderman Boyd? Aye. Alderwoman Davis? Alderwoman Hubbard? Aye. Alderman Coltar? No. Alderwoman Spencer? Alderman Oldenburg? No. Alderwoman Boyd? Aye. Chairman Rohde? No. President Reed. Aye. You have four aye votes and three no votes.